Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear guests, I would like to open this uh, seminar day uh, together with uh, Finance Latvia Association and European Commission. Uh, Finance Finland is organizing a conference about sustainable finance, green finance. Uh, we are so happy to host you today because we have seen a lot of interest to this topic. And today, actually, also the chairman of the board, uh, Ari Kaperi, has uh, an interview in public uh, related to these topics. So uh, this is, at the moment, I would say, the key topic of the finance agenda. What can we do to help uh, the economy to move into sustainable futures? Climate change affects industries uh, at all levels of society. The single most important way to manage the risks caused by climate change is to cut down greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Finance Finland, uh, the organization I'm representing, has a strategic mission uh, to be a strong and responsible builder of well-being in Finland. Together with our member companies, we are constructing and operating environment in which business activities promote Finnish well-being. In February 2017, uh, the Finance Finland Board made a definition of policy supporting actions that seek to limit global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius as per the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. As a major investor, creditor, asset manager and insurer, the financial sector also wants to document its work uh, in combat combating climate change. Uh, Finance Finland and its member companies have created a reporting framework uh, to monitor climate work in the financial sector. Uh, companies can use it to describe their actions uh, in mitigating climate change and to increase the transparency of their work. To help track results over several years, the framework includes climate indicators, and companies can independently choose how they apply these indicators. So this is like a code of conduct we have uh, voluntarily committed uh, to do uh, to increase the disclosure transparency of uh, our, our, our activities. This is only an example uh, calculation on what might might it look like. So uh, if we uh, take the, the indicators and calculate what might be the impact of the Finnish financial sector and uh, the potential effects of our work, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, like a draft calculation. But of course, this year, 2018, will be the first uh, year when these indicators will be used. So in reporting their, uh, their annual uh, results. I hope that many of our member companies will use the common indicators agreed here in Finance Finland. Through this commitment, we, we also uh, participate in Finland's implementation of the Global Action Program 2030, and we have issued these kind of uh, commitments to society. They are in the field of uh, uh, traffic, uh, in the field of insurance, in the field of health information, in the field of uh, uh, e-commerce uh, uh, or e-economy, uh, so lots of different activities. In early 2018, uh, the EU high-level expert group on sustainable finance, the so-called H-LEG, released its final report that included several recommendations about how the financial sector could better direct funding to sources that help mitigate climate change. This report also included recommendations about how sustainable finance could be better integrated into EU activities. These recommendations also aimed to improve the financial market stability and to better account for climate risks. Uh, FFI's uh, Finance Finland's Deputy Managing Director, Esko Kivisari, where, where are you, Esko? There, uh, was member of this 20-member uh, uh, expert group, uh, and I'm very happy that Esko will participate in the, in the panel discussions later about this. Uh, with the climate rapidly changing, companies must learn to manage risks and adopt new practices. Indeed, anticipation and adaptation must gain a growing role in everyday actions. With proper anticipation, companies can even save money and seize new business opportunities. I'm sure about that. Investors have already begun to demand for companies to assess uh, and manage their climate risks more transparently. The, calm, uh, the claim for transparency is backed up by the Financial Stability Board uh, that monitors the global financial system. It considers climate risk transparency a cornerstone for the global economy's stability. Finance Finland uh, 
is very pleased about European Commission, uh, that European Commission has increased its attention to sustainability in financial markets. We believe that the market-based coherent approach can steer investments to assets which have positive impact on environment. It can also reduce the financial sector's exposure to stranded asset risks. It's very important that this work of the Commission uh, continues also uh, during the next uh, EU Commission agenda. Uh, and today we have, of course, European Commission as one of the partners here, uh, and Commissioner Mr. Dombrovskis will be our keynote today in introducing the, those actions, what the present Commission is doing, but also maybe gives a glimpse of what might come next, what would be the next steps uh, by the European Commission. So our work will continue with you, the partners we have here. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, I can introduce uh, now our, our next speaker, uh, who will be uh, our CEO of Varma Mutual Insurance Company, Risto Murto. So uh, Risto Murto uh, uh, is, uh, of course, member of the Board of Finance Finland, but he is also a member of the Supervisory Board of uh, Finnish National Opera, the ATT Institute for Economic Research, uh, uh, member of the board of Sampo, uh, PLC. Sampo is a big uh, financial holding company in Finland, and Wärtsilä, which is, uh, of course, an industrial company. He is, has also a role in academia, so he has been a chairman of the board of University of Oulu since January 2014. I'm very about, happy about this because Oulu happens to be my hometown. It's a town uh, in northern part of Finland uh, where a lot of uh, research activities also take place. So uh, Risto has been chairing the board uh, since 2014. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Risto Murto uh, to introduce ourselves to the topics, how they are looked from the pension uh, company uh, viewpoint. Thank you for participation. Thank you, Pitu. Uh, and, and I'm happy to meet you in Oulu next time. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to give some introductory remark in this great event. Uh, I will only so some slides trying to give you some examples how we are approaching the climate change and what kind of climate change policies we have. Uh, in addition, to, obviously, we have uh, Hanna and Kata here from Pharma. Can you raise your hands? Uh, who are the real experts on, on the field and, and, and working on a daily basis on this. Uh, I start with... Uh, slide describing one aspect, uh, the practical aspect uh, of our climate policy. Uh, we have committed to measure, publish, and decrease our uh, carbon footprint uh, of, of portfolio. This is uh, the, the target was uh, announced two years ago. Uh, the measurement is not a trivial thing here. Uh, in order to really to gather the, uh, the figures, uh, currently we have to use outside sources to consultants to, to measure. That also implies that uh, if we look at our, uh, where we are concentrating, we are pretty much concentrating on our direct portfolio, because in practice that's the way we can the mes uh, have, have a measures. Our uh, target was two years ago is to decrease the carbon footprint in, in listed equities and corporate bonds, uh, bonds 25 percent by the 2020. And in the direct real estate, uh, the target was a little bit lower. And when we were discussing this target, it seems to actually quite demanding uh, how you can measure, uh, decrease the footprint by one quarter in, in by 2020. So far, uh, the progress was, has been good. Uh, you can see from the figures that we have already managed to decrease the footprint in all these direct asset classes by the, uh, by the amount that we have been targeting. Uh, one thing that has been helping us a lot in here is that the, our underlying biggest investments are in, in the Finnish blue chip industrial companies. And 
the atmosphere in, the, in these companies has changed a lot. My general feeling is that uh, in, in the global, global context that uh, we are state of the art when we are discussing with the management on these issues. That is, that is also the quite uh, important thing to uh, discuss because if we are trying to decrease our carbon footprint, I think that uh, it's not meaningful target doing that only with selling the shares. And that's one thing that I will try to come back to in, in this short presentation. Uh, obviously, in the Nordic countries, in Finland, uh, the stock market in sector base is heavily biased to the industrial uh, sectors. That also implies that it's a very heavy in the carbon footprint. But in the same time, usually these companies are in the best in the class in the sector. So uh, in the practicalities, uh, I suppose that nobody here is that happy that if we sell the Finnish industrial sector uh, companies that they are best in class in this respect and ch uh, change to own like a Goldman Sachs that doesn't have a footprint at all. So, our approach has been to have a dialogue engagement on the companies, the local, especially the local companies where we have an impact as well. Uh, it's not only Barma, uh, there's some good quality sure ways uh, what the pension fund industry is doing globally. There's an example of one of them. You can, you can check it out from their web page. Uh, some of his observations, in globally, majority of the pension funds are not actually so active at all. The, uh, I suppose that it's something like 80% of the uh, pension funds that are not really doing anything on that. Uh, European are more committed, that, committed than the Americans or Asian pension funds. And in Europe, it's actually the Nordic funds that are be really driving that. The only open question is that is it the Finland or Sweden that is the most active. Uh, Varma's place was number f uh, five there in the global ranking, according to uh, this one, uh, between the EPP, the uh, big Dutch fund, and the Norwegian uh, pension one, which is so huge. But actually, all the three biggest private pension funds in, in, in Finland are in the top 10 in, in that measure. That I'm very happy and proud that what the Nordic funds and, and, and the Finnish funds are doing in this respect. Uh, regarding the <coughs> EU uh, action plan, we pretty much welcome and, and, and support the, uh, finance action plan, uh, especially the tax money, uh, the benchmarks are relevant for us. And if you think about these targets, uh, you, you also understand how early steps we are in the sense that we have to somehow define the, the words and, and, and classes and, and, and have a tax money there. But you have to start somewhere. I'm quite optimistic regarding the data. I think that there's a good dialogue or dynamics going on in the sense that uh, there's an initiative like this one uh, and other ones that helps us to define the underlying, underlying things that we are trying to measure. And the in, the, in the same time, there's a lot of activity from the commercial providers to, to give us the data. As I give you already the example, we have to make an extra effort at the, at the moment to really to measure the carbon footprint. But looking forward, I think that it it's will come a little bit easier for us and easier for also to the smaller investors to have that. And, and that's the very, very, very crucial point going forward. We are also supporting in our local community, uh, community uh, as a part of the private uh, uh, players uh, that uh, our country and the EU can have uh, also in, in the more demanding targets for the carbon-free uh, economy and society. And, and, and we, are, we are fully behind for that. Uh, 
some observation, uh, observation about the approaches. And, and when we are usually discussing the uh, climate policy and climate risk, we are, uh, by definition, a bit like in the negative mood, we are concentrating on the risk. And that, that's the obvious starting point. It's also in the same in the, in the, in the how the investors has been reacting, that has been uh, to question exclusion. And, and the prime e example, a little bit like in my mind, the classical example for that is the coal producing companies. And then there's a one snapshot uh, about that. The columns are number of the uh, investors has been listing the coal producers. And the other measurement is the, is the valuation. Basically, there's a thousands of the investors that done, doesn't anymore touch the coal producers as, as an investment uh, class of companies. And uh, in the same time, that particular sector has basically gone from the uh, investment universe. But it has been also the easy one because, because of the evolu uh, energy revolution, actually the economic terms, the dynamics in this particular sector has been uh, very, very bad. So the combined market value or profit of this sector is, is, is very, very uh, low. Uh, going forward, I would like to see more discussion on about the opportunities. And, and this is a bad slide because I didn't find, the, let's, let's say, so easy example of the particular sector that is re re driven, driven by the climate change changes. The energy sector in one way can be an obvious candidate for that. So I, I just pick, pick up the one uh, aspect of the battery businesses because that's the relevant also in Finland because there, there is where the investments are now in, in practice going on in, in Nordic countries as well. But it's not only that we are excluding something, the public sector is making it uh, uh, supporting us, it's also making business. And the battery business is obvious uh, example of that in the sense that there's a lot of new uh, investments going on. Somebody is putting equity there. Some management is driving the, 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 uh, this business changes. My general feeling is that if you look at the Nordic industrials, some of the companies are very good at actually at, at the moment changing their strategies and taking care of the opportunities what there are. And for investors, actually the impact can be much, much bigger from the equity side, the new business that the change is generating, than for example, just con concentrating in the green bonds or, or debt instruments. Thank you. Hopefully the next speaker is here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to introduce our keynote speaker and a partner in organizing this uh, seminar today, uh, Commission Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis. Uh, Commissioner Vice President Dombrovskis uh, has been uh, 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 responsible on the finance matters, but also the sustainable finance agenda is very much at ease governance in the European Commission. He's, of course, former Prime Minister of Latvia, and also I'm happy to say that he is also former MEP. So we were actually heads of uh, delegations from Finland and Latvia uh, at some point of time in, in European Parliament. Uh, Mr. Dombrovskis has have a, had a very busy week here in, with the EPP Congress, but uh, I'm very happy that he has taken the, taken the time to be with us today and will deliver now Commission views on the sustainable finance agenda. So floor is yours, Valdis, and we wait for the mic to come here because it will be live streamed all, or, all over Europe. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here in Helsinki and talk about the topic of sustainable finance, which is 
crucial for our future, but also full of opportunities for Europe and also financial industry. So I would like to thank the uh, uh, finance, uh, Finland and Finance Latvia Association for organizing this event. I will focus on the role of the financial sector in the fight against climate change and the transition to, towards a low-carbon economy. I will go uh, through some of the uh, ambitious uh, legislative proposals which European Commission has uh, put uh, forward for that uh, purpose. And I would highlight the opportunities which exist here in the Nordic Baltic uh, uh, region, within the Nordic Baltic financial uh, sector, within sustainable finance. Uh, but let me first say why this topic is uh, so important for all of us, and not only uh, here in Europe, but globally. Uh, just last month, uh, the global community was uh, confronted with several reports. Uh, in particular, the Intergovernmental Panel Climate Change, or IPCC, uh, published a report on 1.5 degree scenario, which underlines the uh, uh, urgent threat of the climate change. Uh, in fact, as of today, uh, the world is heading uh, towards three or even three and a half percent of global warming. Uh, this will have dramatic effects, not only on environment and biodiversity. Uh, natural disasters are becoming more and more frequent. Uh, uh, take, for example, the first fires uh, this uh, summer in the Baltics and in uh, Sweden, north of the Arctic cycle, uh, circle. Sorry. <coughs> Uh, Europe uh, leads and uh, is committed to lead the world in the fight against climate change. And already today, the EU has uh, achieved a 22% reduction of the carbon emissions compared by 1990. And we have a number of policies in place uh, to go much further in order to reduce emissions by at least 40% by 1930, which is our Paris uh, target. So those initiatives include the emission trading scheme, which uh, puts price on carbon and sets a cap on greenhouse, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, that is then uh, gradually adjusted. Uh, here in the Nordics and in the Baltics there are also good examples of climate leadership. Uh, for example, uh, Sweden, Finland and Latvia are at the top of the, uh, uh, are top three in Europe when it comes to the share of renewables of gross uh, uh, share of renewables in gross energy consumption with uh, Denmark, Estonia and Lithuania not far behind. Uh, take the example of the 23rd of October, which was a windy day, and on that day, 22.7% uh, uh, of Europe's entire electricity production came from wind, uh, came from wind with uh, Denmark, Sweden and Lithuania among top 10 producers. Uh, or take the month of September, when 45% uh, of all new cars sold in Nor Norway were electric cars, so fully electric vehicles, and this is a world uh, record. Uh, overall, the Nordics and the Baltics are leading by example, but um, uh, of course they cannot change the uh, world's har carbon footprint uh, alone. This brings me to the role of the EU and in particular the financial sector. Uh, we need large-scale investments into sectors such as energy, land, urban infrastructure and manufacturing. Uh, there is an estimate that uh, we need uh, in Europe additional 180 billion euros annual investment to meet our uh, Paris uh, goals. Uh, and um, uh, there are things which we can do with a uh, public uh, finance. Uh, for example, European Commission has already proposed to devote a quarter of EU's budget to the climate-related actions as of 2021, but uh, public finance alone will not be enough. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why the financial sector needs to be fully involved in this uh, sector. So the financial sector can help prevent climate change, but we policymakers have to give the right tools to do so. Uh, with uh, uh, our uh, action plan on sustainable finance, which we uh, proposed in March uh, this year, we uh, aim uh, to do several things. 
Uh, first of all, we want to incentivize banks, asset managers and companies to direct their capital towards greener projects. We have proposed a draft regulation to agree on EU-wide definitions of on what is green and what is not, or so-called taxonomy, green finance taxonomy. Uh, it will provide clarity for investors and companies that want to invest in green and climate-friendly projects or provide sustainable financial uh, products for the consumers. They will also guide investors who are concerned by greenwashing, as uh, we know many investors are. Uh, a range of other initiatives, an EU standard for green bonds, a European eco-label for green financial uh, uh, products will be developed on this basis. Uh, our second proposal sets targets, asset managers, uh, institutional investors and uh, 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 financial uh, 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 advisors. So st st studies show that the number of uh, uh, investment managers who take uh, sustainability in, uh, into account is uh, raising, but it's not fast enough. Uh, our proposal will require them to disclose how they integrate sustainability considerations into their investment and advisory process. Uh, in addition, those uh, investment ma uh, managers whose uh, uh, products are marketed as sustainable uh, will have to disclose how they achieve their objectives. And finally, the third proposal is about giving investors the tools to measure the financial product's uh, carbon footprint by using financial benchmarks. In, in particular, we are uh, proposing to define standards for two types of climate-friendly benchmarks, low-carbon benchmarks, uh, which have a reduced carbon impact, and positive carbon impact benchmarks, which helps uh, to decrease overall emissions in line with a two-degree target. We have also established disclosure requirements for all environmental, social and governance benchmarks. Uh, this will help more money flow into the decarbonizing of our economy. And in parallel, we are also considering to include climate-related uh, issues on, uh, in non-financial uh, disclosures. And uh, also, we aim to align EU requirements uh, with the work of the Financial Stabilities, Board, uh, Financial Stabilities Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Nordics and the Baltics are already frontrunner when it comes to sustainable finance. Uh, for instance, according to the Asset Owners Disclosure Projects, five out of ten global pension funds with the best approach in climate-related risks are based in the Nordics. Uh, in the past five years, uh, three Nordic EU members have issued uh, over 18.7 billion uh, euros worth of green bonds. Uh, if instead we measure green bonds issued as a percentage of total bonds, uh, the Baltics are doing even uh, better than uh, Nordics, even though the shares are still relatively low. We talk of 3.8% uh, uh, of issuance versus 1.4%. Uh, these uh, successes show that the Nordics and the Baltics are well, play, uh, well placed to scale up their efforts. And the three proposals we have put forward will create more potential for this expansion, not only at EU level, but also globally. This is time of uh, urgency. We call on member states to adopt all three legislative proposals within uh, current uh, political mandate. Of course, our uh, action plan on sustainable finance envisages also uh, further actions, also non-legislative actions. Uh, but uh, 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 to conclude, uh, I would say that European and global capital markets are one of the most powerful tool, uh, tools we have in a fight against climate change. But in many places in the world, it's also one of the most overlooked. So let us uh, give a positive example here in the Nordics and in the Baltics and work to make sustainable finance a, real, a, real, <coughs> sorry, a reality in the Europe and globally. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Dombrovskis. Now we have the time for the panel discussion, so I think that we don't uh, let the audience to ask questions from you, but we take also the other panelists here. So the floor is uh, the chair for you, and I will uh, invite other panelists. We have today. Uh, 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 who is from the deputy governor from the Bank of Finland to take the floor. 
we have some issues with mics. This is always with new tech, the issue. Uh, Maria Nykänen comes there, and then Antoni Balabriga, Global Head of Responsible Business at BBVA and the Chair of the Sustainable Finance Working Group at the European Banking Federation. So, Antoni is there. Uh, Eva Tetere, CEO of CE SEB Latvia and Supervisory Council, Council of the Finance Latvia Association. Welcome. And Risto Murto, uh, our first speaker of the day. So, President and CEO of the Varma Mutual Pension Insurance Company. And I would like to invite Satu Hassi, Member of the Parliament, Chairperson of the Parliamentary Environmental Committee, and also former MEP and former Minister. Of <coughs> so, I think we have everyone there, and everyone's mic is working, I hope. <laughs> So I would, I would uh, actually uh, ask the first question. Uh, we heard now uh, views from the pension insurance company and of course the uh, agenda of the European Commission was presented by, by our uh, Vice President, uh, Mr. Dombrovskis. So I would like to ask now from the uh, private sector, uh, uh, private sector representative, uh, Eva uh, Tetere, you represent uh, SEB in Latvia, and SEB has been very active in this sustainability work, and you have uh, uh, done both in Finland and in Nordics and in Baltics uh, a lot of actions. So I would like to ask you uh, how you see the SEB sustainable finance plans, how will your portfolio climate print in Latvia um, and, if possible, in all other Baltic states? Uh, what kind of impact it will have to this EU sustainable finance and banking sector initiatives? And what do you think uh, uh, will be in the medium term SEB's investment and lending decisions based on the sustainability? Uh, thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Um, yeah, as a practitioner, I think that uh, for SEB, uh, sustainable finance definitely is uh, much, much broader. And I would uh, even go into three different areas. I think the one is really like social responsibility when we do finance. And uh, if we go back to year 2008, 2009, then SEB had... Uh, an aim or um, let's say even like a business strategy stating that we keep families in home uh, those who lost jobs during crisis those who has uh, been a part of reduced salaries we did everything to make, make sure that they can um, they can keep their mortgages and they can uh, remain in homes uh, like example, uh, when it comes to like payday financing, we are the ones which are insisting that every single um, finance decision should be also evaluated from the uh, possibility to repay it. Or, for example, financial literacy, we are the ones who are going out in society and um, training and explaining, starting from schools, students, and even our uh, partners uh, in corporate business, really like uh, increasing uh, literacy of what it is financing. Then the other part, which I really want to mention, part of sustainability, uh, highly appreciated and highly evaluated in SCB, it's uh, everything what comes with transparency anti-corruption, uh, anti-tax avoidance, etc., etc. I think this is really high, uh, high in our agenda whenever credit decision is made. And then, of course, it comes uh, environment. And regarding environment, I think we have done uh, many steps, still probably small ones, but for example, financing uh, renovation uh, of uh, old buildings, uh, definitely one part of our business in Latvia. We have uh, um, close to 50% to of the market share in this area. Uh, so then uh, definitely uh, some of the products, for example, green leasing, financing uh, electric cars, uh, low CO2 emission cars, that's also our part, what we are really, really for. And um, there will be discussions about green bonds. SCB definitely is uh, the leader or front runner in arranging green, green bond issues. So I think that's very broad uh, area what we are doing in SCB. Yeah, thank you. 
I would now like to go back to the uh, public sector and to ask from the central bank. Uh, so why are the central banks uh, so interested about this topic? How do you see it in terms of the financial stability? Is it also an issue of the, of the financial stability for the central bank? So Bank of Finland and Maria Nykänen. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, um, environmental issues, they are uh, very important for the... Uh, real economy and because they are important for the real econ economy they are also important for the financial sector uh, we see that that the financial sector should be on top of this uh, this issue for two reasons one is to manage the risks uh, which are included in the climate change i will come back to that a bit later and then uh, and then to to uh, help finance the the the, the green uh, green uh, green uh, products and green green finance but regarding risks uh, they can be divided into two two uh, groups first the physical risks are these kind of uh, very easy to understand related to extreme climate uh, climate uh, weather conditions and so on storms uh, floods and so on but but i think that what is uh, more important is uh, is this uh, to handle these transition risks which are ar arisen from the uh, transformation from uh, uh, from this uh, high uh, carbon uh, industries to low carbon and there we see that that uh, even though uh, these risks both physical and uh, and these transitional risks uh, are risks for individual companies but the, as a whole they pose a risk for the financial uh, stability as a whole they are systemic and they are material yes thank you uh, now I would like to go to our uh, representative of the EBF, uh, so the chair of the Sustainable Finance Committee of the EBF and from the VBWA, Anthony Balabrica. At the EBF, uh, you look at the sustainable finance agenda from the perspective of the European banking sector. What is the current situation in Europe like? And do you share the, the views which were mentioned that the Nordics are leading uh, this uh, development? Well, thank you for the invitation. Yes, uh, we, are, we clearly Nordics and Baltic countries are leading this. I can, I can, I am not sure if you can hear me. Yeah. The mic is on. Is it on mute? No, I don't think so. It's OK. okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, but I think uh, we think that the Europe in general is leading this in the, in the world, and uh, we appreciate very much the, 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 the action plan uh, led by the European Commission, and uh, we welcome this initiative uh, because market is already running quick. So it is good to have uh, everyone on board. So that's that's fantastic. So later I will uh, I will share with you what uh, what European banks are doing in general because I think we are participating and leading in terms of setting standards, in terms of developing methodologies, in terms of uh, market uh, dynamics and innovation. Um, but I would like to highlight uh, some specific points uh, on the action plan, focusing on the lending activities, no? Because we think that the action plan is, as I said, very welcome. Uh, and we see three issues that are very relevant for banks in, in terms of lending activities. One is uh, all related to taxonomy. Uh, we agree it's a consensus that is the first step, but um, uh, we think that uh, later we will have to uh, see how we can apply this taxonomy to lending activities because they are being defined by activities. So it will be a challenge to, to do that. At the EBF, we want to work also uh, in guidelines to help banks to apply that taxonomy that will come later to lending activities, you know, to clarify a language, to compare, to target setting. So it is an important point. A second point very important for us uh, and in regarding the action plan is all relating to disclosure, corporate disclosure, and the KPIs that are relevant for banks in the lending activities to show the alignment of the lending portfolios or the credit portfolios to Paris Agreement, which is not easy. We think that uh, we have to focus on a sector uh, using KPIs like intensity of CO2 emissions by kilowatt in utilities and try to find the right metrics that give the, the idea of uh, this alignment. So this is also a, a huge challenge for, for banks, so it's very relevant. And, uh, and the third one, obviously, is the, 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 the incentives. No? The C, and we, we, we agree with, the, with that sequential approach of first taxonomy, second measure risk performance, and then if we have evidence, uh, maybe consider uh, green supporting factors. But we also are considering other additional type of incentives. So 
the agenda is uh, plenty. We have met uh, just a few days ago our committee in Dublin, uh, and uh, with the participation of uh, all the uh, national as associations in the Baltic and the Nordic. And well, we are trying to work proactively and engage with the European authorities and with all our stakeholders to promote sustainable finance. Thank you, Anthony. And then I would like to give the floor to uh, Mrs. Satuhassi, who is a uh, former uh, MEP, former Minister of Environment in Finland, and uh, now um, Chair of the Environment Committee at the, uh, the Finnish Parliament. Uh, in your view, does the work uh, the financial industry is doing, uh, does it show in your work? So uh, do you think that the finance industry is doing enough? And are we together doing enough for the final, to combat final, um, the climate change? And uh, what do you think should be our role if, if we are not doing enough? Well, first, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, I think you can. Yes, well... Uh, uh, on your first question, how visible is this work for, for example, uh, the Environment Committee of the Parliament? Uh, I'm, I must admit that it's, it's not uh, uh, striking <laughs> in our work. Uh, in practice, we have uh, given like a pre-statement of, of the plan of, of the Commission this, this year, and we gave a positive statement. Please go ahead, <laughs> like of uh, statement. But on general level, I fi find it uh, very, very important. Uh, I think I'm not able to comment if you are doing enough, but, but basically I think that financial uh, sector has really big muscles in, in, in directing the direction of economy. And uh, well, I think that, uh, I, uh, I guess all we understand that we have to uh, limit climate change in order to uh, prevent uh, like natural uh, big crashes uh, caused by natural catastrophes and changes, like for example sea level rise, which might uh, turn for example, this house and the metro station next to this house useless, etc. But as uh, as uh, um, was already mentioned, uh, we must act in a way that uh, prevents also like uh, um, too rapid changes in in economies. And I think that the uh, financial sector has, it's very important that the financial sector has started the work to, to uh, look at uh, both uh, climate footprint, but also uh, uh, climate uh, like uh, handprint <laughs> or um, um, uh, both the uh, like negative impacts of businesses, but also the positive Im impacts of, of businesses and that this is uh, uh, a more and more important factor in uh, in the decisions of of, um, of, the, of what the companies in uh, financial sector. I think that's uh, very very important, and I think it's also encouraging. And of course, it's uh, 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 wonderful to hear that. Uh, among the ten best uh, companies in uh, in the world, uh, five of them are Nordic companies. But I think that EU legislation can have a, a bigger impact also globally, because uh, already in many sectors, EU legislation has been sort of a global benchmark. In many environmental issues, EU legislation has been a model for other parts of the world. For example, we started greenhouse gas emission trading, and then it spread to uh, northeastern states of USA, California, China, uh, and, and many other parts of the world. And uh, I hope that this example that uh, EU is now showing in, in the financial le sustainability legislation, that uh, this example will be followed um, also other countries, other parts of the world. Yes, this would be wonderful if we can lead the way uh, to sustainable uh, futures uh, with the European legislation. Of course, this is something the European Commission now tries to work with. Before giving the floor to uh, our Vice President, I would like to ask uh, Risto Murko, Murto, you uh, already presented some very convincing numbers, how you have been able as a Varma mutual pension company to reduce your, your carbon footprint uh, 
based on the targets you have made. One fourth uh, <clears throat> of the footprint is already gone, but it will become more challenging and challenging, of course, uh, when time flows. So uh, do you think that, uh, uh, what, what, what's your uh, like motivation to do this? Is it uh, coming inside the, uh, the pension industry or is it investors who demand such actions? And uh, what is your, your view on, for example, the DFCD reporting standards? That do they come that they actually the market forces strive for more disclosures? Uh, and do you see it in your work that it would be beneficial to have uh, more disclosed uh, standardized information, like based on the FSB, uh, DCFD reporting standards? We really much welcome and support that we have a more disclosure. Uh, and, and I already touched a little bit about the issue. It's still very messy, time consuming and costly to have a good measurement, even to, our, to have it in our portfolio. And if you, we have the resources, but if you go to the, as a smaller investor, <coughs> you need the cheaper ways to get the information more, more standardized. But uh, uh, it's still messy, but uh, I'm quite optimistic that uh, there is a pressure and motivation to increase that. Uh, yeah, and in the early stage, but uh, I see some of the commercial providers stepping in and, and, and try to build the databases uh, and, and have a dialogue with the companies. Just in the, that's in the status point that uh, uh, in, in Finnish context, I, I find, it, find it that uh, the discussion with the companies and with the, with the management is actually in looking more like opportunities, how to change the strategies, how to take the opportunity, how to make investment, how to make the business because to adapt to changes. And, and, and then this, this we can have a uh, common future. Thank you. So now let, let me turn back to Vice President uh, of the European Commission, Valdis Dombrovskis. Uh, Actually, what you did in March was coming very fast. We had the high-level expert group, and it was only like a couple of months later, Commission was able to, uh, the, to decide on this very ambitious action plan. Uh, I would like to hear your uh, views on you know, how did it happen in, at the Commission? So was it uh, easy to get going so fast? So is, is there ur the feeling of urgency among the commissioners? And what were the issues discussed? Uh, you know, the main uh, uh, motivation for the European Commission to move ahead fast, and what do you see will be the future? Well, uh, first of all, on uh, the preparation of our, uh, our action plan on sustainable finance, uh, well, actually, it was more than a couple of months because a, a high-level expert group was actually working for one uh, year. So they were working for one year, producing interim report, we were producing a final report. Uh, it was uh, uh, either uh, 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 December uh, of last year or January of uh, this year when the final report was out, and uh, then it took a couple of months between the final report of the expert group and our uh, uh, package, which was in March, and then it took another couple of months until May uh, when we came with the first three legislative proposals I just uh, uh, outlined. So it still takes uh, side, uh, some time. Uh, uh, I think uh, with this uh, action plan we were maybe uh, just uh, slightly ahead of the global trends, because you'll see that actually this uh, uh, sustainability is uh, going into mainstream of the financial sector. There are many uh, international uh, initiatives. There's lots of uh, commitment, uh, self-commitment of industry itself. So actually, we see it uh, developing uh, uh, quite uh, 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 quite fast. Uh, uh, our discussions uh, within the uh, uh, Commission, uh, uh, of course, there are always uh, limitations. In, in some areas, I would have wished maybe for a more ambitious uh, 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 way forward, also for some measures which were discussed and then later not really uh, uh, adopted, for example, so-called green supporting factor, which would adjust also the uh, capital requirements uh, to the banks uh, if they invest in, uh, uh, so to say, some targeted green and uh, uh, sustainable uh, projects like we already now have uh, uh, SME supporting factor, so basically designing something along those lines. There were proposals in European Parliament, but for, uh, for whatever reasons, it was 
quite strongly opposed by uh, member states, especially, I would say, on the regula re regulatory side, uh, but also uh, there was quite broad opposition in uh, European Parliament. So uh, we uh, were not able to get everything uh, through what, uh, uh, what we wanted to be in this action plan, but I think it's still a very good uh, beginning. We uh, uh, said from the beginning that we would be ambitious in following up the report on a high-level expert group, and basically we came with the proposals and follow-up in all key recommendations of high-level expert group. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe we take uh, your view about this green supporting factor. I, I guess you all know what it is. Uh, so it means that uh, in the capital adequacy uh, calculations of a bank, it would be uh, taking into account what kind of investments or lending activities the bank has vis-a-vis -vis the green sectors. And this has been really uh, quite a debated topic in the European Parliament and in, in the finance industry. But I will ask now uh, from our Bank of Finland representative, because Maria Nykänen has has also worked at the Financial Supervisory Authority of Finland and is currently also uh, at the board of the Financial Supervisory uh, Authority. So maybe you can comment on the uh, central bank's view or the Financial Supervisory view. Do you think that the green supporting factor would be would be good if we think about the long line of uh, developing risk-based uh, risk uh, 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 system? So, so was it, in your view, a good thing to propose? or the brown penalizing factor? Yeah, I think that there is one challenge when we calculate the risk weights on, based on historical data, because that's old, that's old data, and, and that is just how the, the system is, is, is built. And especially in this climate change, because that happens in the future. So I think that there is a big risk that, that whatever measure we use, and make calculations on capital requirements based on old data, that they, they will highly underestimate the risks related to, 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 to climate, climate change. Um, but I would say that, that green supporting factor has a problem in that sense that, that when financing uh, targets or objects or, or, or whatever, uh, the risk weight and the capital requirements should reflect the real risk of the, of the, of the financed uh, activity or, or, or target. And therefore, uh, I would be hesitant in, in incentivizing banks to finance, uh, finance on, on other reasons, no matter how good or fine or worth promoting we find, find certain things. Uh, I think that the latest uh, financial crisis is a prime example of, of good intentions turning into a terrible, terrible outcome. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that we should also not only look into, into, into green supporting factor, but also see whether it would be useful to assess the, and, and explore the possibilities for, for the brown penalizing factor, as, as you said. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is I can wholeheartedly share your views uh, from the Finance Finland point of view, but like I said, it was a debated topic also at the EBF, so maybe, Anthony, you can uh, tell a little bit about uh, the discussion on the Commission package uh, at the EBF uh, Working uh, Committee, which you chair. No, with uh, <clears throat> regarding the, the green supporting factor, as I, as I said, our, our approach is uh, the sequential approach. Um, but well, we have certain level of urgency, so uh, we have to work quick, and probably we should start as uh, there are already some initiatives on, on energy efficiency, efficiency mortgages, where we can start to get data. We are starting to get data. In fact, it was uh, released just uh, uh, a few weeks ago uh, uh, an article on a, on, a, on a post from Bank of England uh, with a research showing that. Um, well, um, uh, high energy efficiency mortgages had uh, around 20-25% better performance than the other ones. So, and uh, where there were practically 1.8 million assets on this survey. So, well, uh, I think data in this kind, in, the, in this specific asset, is practically there. Is uh, so we think that uh, we should uh, work following the orthodoxy to, to, to maintain sustainability of the system. But in, the, in this case, in this uh, energy efficiency mortgages, we think that there is a room of opportunity to accelerate uh, on this topic. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Tetere. Uh, you, uh, of course, uh, mentioned that SEB is a very big issuer of green bonds, uh, and uh, there is now this proposal also to develop taxonomy for the for the green green bonds. What would be your messages to the European Commission when they are now thriving with this agenda? And I think, um, as a, as from the practice and being just one um, player in the market, uh, private capital, I think for us definitely it will be very important uh, to understand the definitions and to understand like uh, what are the metrics. Um, of course, they should be comprehensive, but at the same time, I think they should be very simple to to follow because otherwise uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, play around and uh, maybe window dressing a little bit. So I think if we can uh, agree on some uh, simple uh, simple metrics, uh, this taxonomy, I think uh, it definitely helps. And when you're talking about green mortgages, and uh, as I, I said, we also have a product green leasing, um, I fully agree that we should uh, assess risks based on the risk factors. But on the other hand, I also uh, strongly believe that the data would show that green mortgages and green leasings will be much more sustainable, and the recovery rates definitely will be higher just because of the product type that uh, if we are providing something for the um, house which is really uh, sustainable and long uh, uh, future uh, lasting then then definitely recovery rates will be higher so it can be part of the measure for the banks yes thank you vice president yeah I just wanted uh, to come back a bit on this um, green uh, uh, taxonomy uh, because uh, uh, indeed we are now uh, uh, in a process of uh, developing and uh, uh, first of all, uh, exactly for the reason to avoid window dressing or, or, or greenwashing. Uh, so, so what's the idea? Our legislative proposal is actually not green uh, taxonomy but the governance system of the green taxonomy. Uh, and uh, not to lose time, so we are now uh, parallelly working on two tracks. So we are now uh, working on a legislative proposal, which is now with co-legislators, hope uh, uh, it will be adopted still during this uh, political cycle before European Parliament elections. Uh, and uh, But this will set a governance uh, uh, structure, how uh, those green taxonomies can be uh, developed, and there are a number of uh, areas where we uh, want to, it to gradually develop, starting first with uh, uh, climate mitigation and climate uh, adaptation. But in order not to lose uh, time, in a sense, first we set the governance structure, then we uh, get it going, then people start looking at uh, uh, green taxonomy, we set up a, a technical expert group, which is in parallel actually already working on those matters. We some how some colleagues from the expert group also here in this room. Uh, and. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, already uh, they will be able to present, so to say, fairly developed uh, product and will be able to gain uh, some time in this way. But um, uh, uh, it's also clear that we uh, uh, are trying to set the governance system which is adoptable and also the legal form of taxonomies, which is uh, uh, adoptable, uh, probably in the form of delegated acts, uh, because our thinking will evolve what is green, how to measure it, and, and so. So uh, it needs to be something which we can adapt on a uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, regular and, and timely uh, basis. Of course, at some stage it will help to start to stabilize, but in a first stage I could imagine that our thinking will evolve and we'll have to adjust it uh, as we'll gain more experience. Yes, thank you. Uh, Satu Hase, you have been a member of the European Parliament and you have been part of the many de negotiations uh, in this, this field and other, other fields. Uh, do you think that uh, this uh, Commission package, uh, what kind of uh, difficulties it might have in the European uh, Parliament or uh, what is the role of the national parliaments? Of course, you are also issuing views for the Finnish government, uh, what should be done in the co-legislative process. So how do you see the roles of the parliament and uh, uh, as with your experience from both houses? Well, I, I think that uh, you have the same, same experience uh, as I, I have from European parliament that all important parts of uh, pieces of legislation, uh, they uh, 
uh, there is always very intensive lobbying <laughs> and but uh, actually because I, I have all, all, almost uh, five years already been away from European Parliament, I, I don't know exactly what kind of lobbying from the financial sector uh, could be expected on, on, on this issue. I think that the Commissioner and, and you uh, might know this, uh, these details <laughs> much better. But, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, always when there are um, important uh, pieces of legislation which change the rules for uh, uh, powerful, important businesses, there is <coughs> intensive lobbying. But I think that uh, uh, legislation is only a part of a necessary uh, change uh, in the uh, way of thinking that we need. Because uh, Climate, uh, 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 climate protection, um, uh, limiting climate change, that's basically a huge investment uh, program uh, where we need to invest now to uh, avoid uh, bigger costs uh, uh, in the future. Uh, costs of the future in two ways. Uh, f first, of course, uh, the cost of climate change itself, but many uh, of the investments we are needed, needing, for example, in the energy sector and, and, uh, and transport sector, uh, their nature is such that uh, uh, the cost is upfront. Uh, you need a bigger investment now, but the operating cost is lower than uh, the traditional uh, fossil-based uh, solutions. And uh, I'm not an insider in, in financial sector uh, um, uh, enough to, to like uh, be able to comment uh, how big like. Uh, uh, attitude uh, problem this is, but I just guess that uh, we need uh, also to think uh, the attitudes and ways of thinking and that the changing legislation is only part, but an important and crucial part in this uh, uh, change, of, uh, uh, change of the way we work. Yeah, this is, this is very true that legislation is the only, not the only thing. And uh, what I can say from the uh, finance industry uh, viewpoint, I think it's the mindset of the top management, which has changed a lot uh, recently, which we also heard uh, here that uh, this is a topic in the boardroom. Uh, and there is a willingness and there is already a possibility to, to take a very long term view. But of course, then you need to make sure that your uh, all the other compliance matters and legislative matters are met. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to do that. So there is a lot of challenge uh, for the finance industry. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's encouraging. And I think that one uh, important thing uh, 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 why we need legislation is that there are many actors who think that what does it help if I uh, uh, work well, if when <coughs> others don't. Let one like uh, meaning of the legislation is that it makes sure that also the others must work well. Uh, Risto Murto, we already discussed a little bit from the big institutional investor uh, point of view uh, how this uh, commission agenda looks like, and you all already mentioned this uh, initiative which commission has now put forward that they are very important for the pension companies as well. But I if we don't only look at the disclosure, what would be uh, the best thing from the uh, pension company point of view, what the commission could do? Is there something, you know, uh, you you should uh, give a strong message to the Commission in their continuing this work. And I, uh, I refer to also this matter, what uh, Vice President Nogroski was saying, that this might go to the level two, so then it will be very detailed. Maybe this simplicity, which was uh, mentioned by Mrs. Tetere, is not anymore <laughs> such a topic. So, so what would be, uh, from your viewpoint, uh, a good legislative framework from a pension company? Point of view. Uh, as a starting point, uh, the Finnish pension industry has a national legislation, so it usually has an indirect uh, impact. But I'm a little bit worried about uh, the thing about that if we are only concentrated in, in, in regulation and, and the debt finance, 
uh, are we building up the business opportunities? We have a lot of investments in the US, and, and they have a totally different kind of mm -hmm. discussion there. They are not using the same framework of words that we are using. But if you look at, for example, the energy sector, it seems that they are more active. Mm -hmm. in a, in a, there's a lot more, uh, more going on than in the Europe. And, and as an investor, you, it's easier to go in, in an investor than in the Europe. So uh, it, it, it's a little bit like a broader uh, question that you should have a framework where the businesses has a uh, 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 opportunity to really to invest and try, try to change. And not too much relying that let's have a new regulation and public investments and, and have a next uh, semi-public uh, fund to finance that. You so, uh, de facto, you are saying that, for example, the capital markets <coughs> would be very good because that would uh, that is not about legislation and regulation so much. It's uh, opening up uh, the capital markets and make it, making it easier uh, to you know invest yeah. and to raise capital and uh, that. That's an obvious, obvious example, and an uh, obvious e example is the same as a market, mm -hmm. which is a very hard nut. But at the moment, it's easier to finance the US than Europe. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I would li now like to open the floor for the questions from the audience. Are there some? Uh, I can see a lot of hands already. So maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, let's take from the third row. Uh, here, here, the first question. Oh, wow. It's <laughs> the first time I speak to a box. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sindre Stor, and I'm here as a representative of the Norwegian Security Dealers Association. I have two questions, one small one and one a bit larger. <laughs> the small question goes to you, uh, Risto. Um, in your slide, uh, you showed the, the valuation compression for the coal producers. And did you actually imply that there was a correlation in that picture or causality? Uh, I a little bit touched on that in, in, in my presentation. Uh, it was an easy one in the sense that uh, it was so easy to jump in that process because that was a basic sector which was the underlying economics was actually gone. Uh, and, and I suppose that, uh, that the investors delisted that from the, uh, the investment universe, uh, speeded up the process. Mm. But even without that, I suppose that the, you, you can find the uh, impact. All right. Because I only observe that there has been the same kind of, of evaluation compression in very many sectors, and they might also have something to do with the rising oil price over the period. Yeah. Now, the big question. Um, I'm curious to hear, Mr. Dombrovskis, what the real ambition is on a global level of this green finance initiative in Europe. You have probably been asked this very many times, but I'm still curious to hear the answer. Um, there are about 1.2 billion people living in the Western developed world. We don't use much more energy every year now. It's like actually our energy consumption is flat or declining already. There are five to six billion people in the developing part of the world. They will most likely continue to develop. They will become richer, they will get washing machines, they will get cars, they will want air travel. And that's where the increased carbon footprint will emerge. Not here in the West, but in the developed world. The Green Finance Initiative might be among other initiatives globally. One way of just pushing everybody into spending more on energy. I mean, if the capital cost for energy goes up, then energy becomes dearer. What are your reflections on that? How is the, Nor uh, the, the um, European financial community going to have a real impact on how the developed world with four, five, six billion people climbing up the income ladder um, in the, the, for the next couple, well, 20 to 30 years? Thank you. Uh, okay, on this, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, broader uh, question than um, uh, uh, sustainable finance uh, uh, only. Maybe also to come uh, back to some of the previous uh, points uh, raised. Uh, 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 of course, uh, when we look at 
uh, say, EU sectoral policies uh, in uh, different uh, areas. We set our Paris uh, climate change goals, but then we are coming with the sectoral proposals how much uh, emission reduction it means, say, in, uh, in, in housing sector, how much it means in cars, how much in other areas, uh, which share of renewables, and so on and so forth. And uh, all those targets are being set. And uh, each of those targets will require lots of investment from uh, companies, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, people, and that's where we can also connect uh, the need, demand for investment, which will be there, with uh, uh, finance, which uh, 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 should be available, and uh, 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 where we should have a clear uh, framework how it uh, uh, how it happens. Uh, now, uh, of course, when we talk about uh, sustainable uh, uh, finance, uh, financial market uh, initiatives, capital market initiatives, uh, of course, it primarily will have first and foremost effect in places where uh, financial markets, capital markets are well uh, developed. Uh, but then. Um, uh, 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 I, I think that uh, also when uh, the developing economies are, uh, 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 so to say, uh, catching up with the level of development, they will not need to go through all uh, the past which maybe, so to say, Western world was uh, following. Uh, they uh, don't need uh, to build, so to say, m more coal-powered uh, coal plants to uh, uh, satisfy their increased uh, uh, energy uh, uh, needs, increased electricity demands, as, as you mentioned. Uh, they may as well uh, uh, do it on the basis of uh, 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 renewables. They can uh, use solar, they can use wind. Actually, we see it's already uh, 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 happening. For example, Ch China is investing uh, very much in uh, 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 renewables, uh, uh, which had been uh, developed, so to say, in the uh, West and made financially viable in, in the West, so they can leapfrog a number of technologies. So yes, uh, uh, it's likely that their energy demand will raise, they will be willing to have higher uh, uh, living standards, but they will not have uh, to produce uh, uh, energy in uh, the same ways uh, 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 Europe or US was producing uh, uh, 50 or 100 years uh, ago. So they will be uh, uh, able to use uh, 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 much more uh, cleaner uh, technologies for that. Take a brief comment from Mrs. Hassi. Yeah, well, uh, I'm an elec electrical power engineer and I would like to comment that uh, clean energy investments are not necessarily any more uh, more uh, uh, more expensive than uh, traditional fossil-based um, investments because the technology has uh, developed really very rapidly and um, in most countries in the world when we talk about uh, new electricity production wind power is already the cheapest option and in many countries uh, even solar power is the cheapest option i have even seen examples of areas where new solar can produce cheaper electricity than old coal-fired power stations. And of course, uh, that's not the whole solution, but it makes it very much easier. Thank you. And Antoni Valabriga. Yes, no, only to, to give a positive message uh, on this uh, global approach you know, to, the, to, the, to the change, the transitions that we need. Um, we also, self-regulation is another way to promote and let's, let's share that 28 banks from uh, the, the, the whole globe, including China, including Asia Pacific, Africa and South America, we have uh, agreed to develop with UNEPFI, with the United Nations Principles for Responsible Banking, and those 28 banks have agreed to define uh, targets, long-term terms to, to align to Paris Agreement. We're going to launch these principles the next 26 in Paris. And while this is another example that uh, the private sector uh, wants to wants to lead this, and uh, so it's, I think it's another another way to, to see the, the, the whole challenge. You know? Thank you. I have time for one another question, and I will give the floor to Joni Keronen from Climate Leadership Council. Okay, thank you very much. At first, I would like to congratulate organizers. Wow, climate event full of audience from finance area, and the Vice President, European Commission as well. So my question is that um, I was like uh, two months ago in San Francisco Global Climate Action Summit 
and was listening to the BlackRock investment director, and he said that they have sent TCFT letters to hundreds of the biggest like investment companies. And we have also learned TCFT in our, our association, and at least personally, I think it's a great concept. And uh, even before coming to the reporting, it would give a good framework for the company strategy on this climate issue. So I would like to ask that how do you see the TCFT and are there ways to speed it up? Who would like to take the floor? Yeah, Anthony? Well, the, uh, I think that TCFD was a key milestone to, to build this momentum, uh, this inflection point that we are living. So we also welcome, uh, as banks, we, we have been piloting a TCFD uh, exercise with also with NP5, 16 banks in this case, trying to develop methodologies to, uh, to scenario analysis on physical risk, on traditional risk. It has been very challenging. Um, trying to develop a, an open methodology to, to be shared later for the whole industry, but uh, we are totally convinced that that's the way. Uh, all 16 banks has uh, commit to to disclose uh, TCFD report uh, next year with the specific uh, steps done. Uh, banking industry is a, is, a, is, a, is a key player, and obviously there are some recommendations that are easy uh, and some are more difficult. <laughs> But in any case, uh, that's, the, that's the way, and we, we also welcome that the uh, European Commission uh, highlight that, uh, point out that the TCFD should be the, the, the standard to be aligned in terms of disclosure on climate. So that's, that's I think, it's, uh, we think that it's uh, the, real, the real time and the real, the, the real approach. Yes, uh, uh, Risto Murto, you are also a member of the Pension Insurance Board of uh, Finance Finland. Uh, when does the pension company uh, start sending these kind of letters to the big companies to disclose with TCFD or with other uh, standard? That, that's a good point. Uh, I think that we should start with the dialogue with the top management and, and, and a little bit conservative CFOs of the companies because it's an extra for uh, work for them, uh, but it's starting. Okay, I have promised to end the panel exactly at uh, 9.55, but we have time for one last question, which is the, to raise your hand if you agree. Uh, so, do you think that with these uh, forces of finance industry, we are able to uh, stop the global warming to 1.5 degrees? What is the Paris target? If we do this, uh, are we successful in our report? Hands up if you think that we are we are going to be successful. Okay, I, I saw enough hands that we can end up with this, with, with this uh, positive note. So thank you for the panelists. It was very uh, very good to have you here and very insightful comments on your behalf. Now we have a, a very short break and then uh, my colleague from the Finance Latvia Association, Sanda Lipina, will take the, the role as a moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. thank, thank you very much. So we'll try to uh, take us forward. We'll uh, um, see to get uh, our colleagues uh, from the uh, unplanned short uh, break uh, back in. So to take um, take the discussion uh, forward, um, let me briefly set the stage for uh, the rest of the event. And uh, our goal really is to uh, foster an action-focused dialogue between the industry and the public sector experts regarding the EU strategy for sustainable finance that we just heard in uh, quite some detail, and the implementation modalities and both the traditional and innovative approaches to financing the sustainable investments in the Baltic and Nordic uh, region. Um, the intention is, I think the, the one way to summarize the, the previous panel discussion is, the intention is to change incentives and culture across the board all along the investment chain. And uh, we will delve into, uh, into this uh, and what this means for the European financial sector in the two um, upcoming uh, panels. First, uh, we will focus on the impacts and the indicators and uh, how to measure um, 
a bit of the discussion that we already had, and I was actually um, wondering how many of you understood the acronyms that were being used, the TCFD uh, and the likes, and uh, my guess is given the cross-section of population we have in this room, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, joint learning that we will need to do. So for our experts on the panel, I will ask to spell out uh, all of that uh, new soup of acronyms uh, for, for the benefit of, uh, of the audience. And um, right, so just to recap the scale of the challenge that we're actually looking at, um, I've uh, pulled together some of these uh, numbers that indicate the very much the multi-stakeholder and non-linear world that we're looking in, in in this realm and the challenge for the decentralized governance that we all face. Uh, so um, by some of the uh, research, of which there is quite plenty, so I take that none of these numbers really mean anything as, as, a, as a precise point, but they are really as trend lines we see that the engagement by the regulators, by the industry, is up uh, by about 163% over the past sen uh, seven years, meaning there's a lot more of initiatives out there. Uh, we also heard, uh, I believe just yesterday, in a Dublin uh, summit on, on, uh, on climate finance uh, with the European K KYC, the Climate Innovation Center, that the Investments globally done in a non-sustainable way account currently for about 86%. So that's to the scale of the challenge. Uh, at the same time, we know uh, that the EU has set out to reduce the carbon footprint uh, by 40% by 2030. And we know that the tenors of loans globally uh, are uh, over five, uh, five years for just above 30% of loans. So we're talking of long-term future being financed by fairly short-term um, financing. And with, with that um, in the background, before we get into the first panel, I would like to give uh, floor to our uh, esteemed partner, the European Banking Federation Head of Sustainable Finance Working Group, Antony Balabriga, to talk us through what are the European banks doing uh, faced with this, and then we will proceed to the panel discussion. Now it works? I think so. Okay. Well, again, it's a great opportunity to share with you what European banks, what we are doing to, to fight climate change. Um, banks, for sure, have a, a key role in the transition to low carbon economy and more resilient economy. Uh, in fact, uh, European banks finance today around 70% of the economy in Europe. Um, well, at the European Banking Federation, uh, which gathered 32 banking national associations, uh, more than 3,500 banks, is fully committed on this agenda. It's uh, one of the top priorities. That's the reason why we organize this sustainable finance working group, where Nordic and Baltic associations also participate, and which I have the chair to, the, the honor to chair. Let me start with my main message. Um, European banks are leading in the world the journey for greening the financial system. It's a huge opportunity for banks, and we are clear first movers, especially the Nordic and the Baltic. So I'm going to give you seven strong reasons why we strongly believe that European banks are leading this transition. So the first one is that European banks uh, are leader setting and using the new market standards, such as green bond principles, social bond principles, green loan principles, and we have a, a huge amount of examples of European banks promoting and even using, obviously, green bonds and, and, and using green loan principles as a standard. Secondly, European banks are leaders developing new methodologies to better manage climate risk and opportunities. We need to create frameworks, tools, and we need to build capabilities within our banks. Well, here you have two great examples. On the left side, we have comment before. We have the work done on the pilot to implement TCFD recommendations on a scenario analysis, followed recommended by TCFD, an initiative led by UNEPFI, where 
we have 16 banks participating, ha eight of them are European ones. So the WIT2 reports were already released this year on transition risk and physical risk, thanks also to the support of Oliver Wyman and Acclimatize. This is a good example. Another example of new methodologies is an emerging project initiated by ING and two degree investment initiative to develop a methodology to assess the alignment of our credit portfolios to Paris Agreement, a project that will be, will have more banks joining the initiative. At the end of the day, BVA will be one of them. And I think that the, the, first, the third fact is that European banks are clear first movers creating new client and customer solutions. Green solutions for corporate and institutional clients, such as green certified bilateral loans, green certified project finance, green syndicate loans, or green credit revolving facilities. So at the corporate level and institutional level, there is a lot of dynamic in the marketing. It's, it's a real, uh, already a reality. But also green solutions for retail customers, households, and SMEs, such as energy efficiency mortgages, responsible investment funds, green consumer loans, advice services to help customers to take better decisions on uh, environmental issues. And this is my conclusion. Definitely, there is life for green finance beyond green bonds. The fourth reason one is that European banks are clear promoters of proactive engagement with regulators and supervisors. We have seen before, there is no other region in the world with such level of complicity within the banking industry. Practically, all national banking associations have created a sustainable finance working group to help banks and lead this conversation with regulators and supervisors. And at the BF, this working group was, was launched 18 months ago. And, uh, and our priority is to engage with the regional authorities in the implementation of the action plan, a fundamental step towards a more sustainable financial system. And that shows the international leadership of the EU on this field. We are already providing insights to technical expert group, thanks to our shadow technical expert group, four from different subgroups with the participation of practitioners and experts from all the, our community. One of the examples of this engagement will be the EBF guidelines we will release next year, just when green taxonomy will be defined. Guidelines to help those banks that want to apply the new UA taxonomy to their lending portfolio ensuring a common language within the industry for voluntary target setting and disclosure. A proactive engagement that European banks also promote with other key stakeholders of civil society. Here you have a good example, Share Action, a relevant watcher that has published some reference papers about banks and climate. Uh, and well, we are engaging with them as well. The latest report is a showcasing leading, leading approaches to climate change within the European banking sector. Case studies on climate-related disclosures and targets, a scenario analysis aligning sector policies to the Paris Agreement, client engagement, mobilizing capital for the low carbon transition, governance strategy, and education. So this is also critical, and they sh shows clearly that we have to evolve. We are just starting but there are already some best practices in the market that can, that can give us a lot of inspiration how to do it. The sixth reason is that European banks are leading the definition, as I said before, of the principles for responsible banking, an initiative led by UNEPFI, in line with the principles of responsible investment, the principles of sustainable insurance. This is the missing piece of the whole financial system. This initiative is being led by 28 banks, to build a global coalition to align bank society to society's goals. Nine of them are European banks. The principles for responsible banking is our collective response to align our business to long-term targets and better integrate the environmental and social challenges. They will be launched in November 26 in Paris. In fact, we encourage all banks to sign these principles. It doesn't matter where they are in the sustainability journey. What matters is their commitment to the common agenda of financial prosperity. Finally, the principles will help us to become better banks and reinforce the sustainability of the whole financial system. And the last reason, more and more leading banks are setting new ambition and defining strategies 
and long-term targets on climate. One example of this is VBA, where I lead global responsible business discipline. And as we announced last February, uh, we, had, uh, we have our pledge 2025. This is our strategy in climate change and sustainable development based on three pillars, finance, manage, and engage. Finance, we want to mobilize 100 billion to hold climate change and achieve SDGs in the next eight years. Manage, we work to align our activity with the climate objectives of Paris Agreement. And third, engage, we will engage with all our stakeholders to collectively promote the financial sector's contribution to sustainable development. So, well, to conclude, um, our vision of the world is marked by a sense of urgency, but a sense of opportunity. As our BBA executive group chairman said a few months ago, we need to reimagine the role of banking in society. Banks need to redefine their purpose, a purpose that is transformational and massive, aimed at having a positive impact in people's lives. <coughs> I am totally convinced that European banks are working hard to make it real. We have a lot to do. We need to think big, to do more, faster, and all together with our stakeholders. It must be, it must be our promise to our future generations. And that's, thank you very much. all what it means to be leading a working group at the European Banking Federation. It means uh, on, on a topic uh, important as, as, as this one. So we will now uh, proceed to our uh, panel, uh, panel discussion. And um, to start out with, um, I will um, ask, let me, here's, um, I will um, ask um, Leah Strashina from the uh, Swedbank Latvia to give us um, a bit of a, uh, helicopter view on the sustainable development goals, uh, the other acronym that somehow we managed to omit uh, in the first half of this uh, event, that's actually very much in, in the background of all of this discussion. So without further ado, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, we'll move on to, um, to your yep, inter intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, can I have the... Or sure. yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, I will kind of have a bit of a step back to the economy from kind of financial sector because I think it's it's very important also speaking about the sustainable finance to to have this holistic view and uh, because normally when we speak about sustainable finance we somehow, you know, mostly talk about climate change, you know, environmental protection uh, factors, but uh, sustainability is more uh, than just that. And, and this is what we're trying to do also at Setbank Macro Research. So we're trying to integrate the sustainability criteria and into uh, also um, economic analysis, forecasting, also risk assessment. And that's why we also developed these um, Swedbank sustainability indicators uh, to basically see where we are in, in the Nordics and in the Baltics, because this is very important to, uh, to uh, if we want to see where we want to be, then we start with, with where we are. Uh, but then speaking about where we want to be, then we took, uh, as you mentioned already, we took, uh, you know, as a kind of a benchmark, we took uh, United Nations Sustainable um, Development um, Goals, and uh, we, um, uh, group them into these main, uh, you know, sustainability criteria we're talking about, environmental, social governance, and then we added, of course, the, the, the growth uh, as a fourth one, as a fourth pillar, because, of course, it's, it's all, and, and also is, as in uh, 2030 agenda, you know, the sustainable growth rate, uh, growth is kind of the uh, underlying, uh, underlying goal. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we did, uh, we have uh, 41 indicator, uh, economic indicators, and uh, we uh, grouped them into these four pillars and linked them to the uh, SDGs. Uh, and then in order to, you know, to, to have the benchmark, to have the target where we want to be, we said, okay, we want to be where 
the best are now. So basically 2015 when uh, uh, Agenda 2030 was uh, approved, uh, we take uh, the best in the European Union, uh, best countries, and then uh, we set them as a target, as a benchmark. And according to this benchmark, we see, we calculate how realistic it is for the Baltic uh, economies or for the Nordic economies uh, to be there by 2030. Uh, and then we put the traffic lights, you know, depending how realistic, how probable it is. And then we assess it by, of course, historical progress, because that's how we can do that. And that's why, you know, these, uh, uh, these traffic lights are, uh, you know, a bit different for, for Baltics and for Nordics, because historical progress in the Baltics has been better. So it's more kind of likely that the, the future progress will be, uh, you know, uh, more fast as well, faster as well uh, in the future. Uh, uh, but then, you know, here are the results, basically, for, for these four pillars, for um, Baltic countries and for Nordic countries. And I think it's uh, kind of uh, telling uh, and uh, proves once again the importance of this holistic approach, because we see, if we look at the Baltics, we see that the Reds, you know, are in, in social inclusion. And if we look uh, at the, uh, you know, Nordics, we see that the, be the uh, kind of the, the, the most potential, you know, the most action is needed in environmental protection, which may be a bit more, uh, a bit surprising, you know, given that, of course, we are front runners as we already uh, spoken in, in the morning. Uh, but that also, you know, because this can be seen both as, you know, the need for policy action, of course, because this is where we are lagging, but it's also, uh, these indicators also can be seen as, uh, you know, where the biggest potential lies, you know, so, uh, and, and where the biggest potential, including also for investment, for financing. But that also, you know, that also kind of uh, forms the, the, the agenda for politicians. And here I have uh, the example, you know, we all notice the very hot and dry summer, and you know the 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 the, the, the discussions about climate change, you know, uh, were quite quite hot. And we had elections in Sweden in September, and we had elections in Latvia in October. And in Sweden, you know, the uh, the climate change questions were second most discussed after the immigration. And in Latvia, it was nearly there was nearly no discussion on on climate change as such. Uh, so I think, and this is, you know, looking at these results, it's, uh, I think it's quite understandable because we have other problems also to, to you know, to, to solve. You know, if, you, if there's problems with inequality and, and uh, still uh, poverty, then of course, you know, politicians have something else on the agenda to be first. But then it's, it's still, I think it's, it's important to, to look all, at all of these factors, you know, and another one, of course, and we also touched upon this uh, a little bit in, in, in the morning, uh, in, um, governance, you know, transparency, uh, development of capital markets, because if we want to, you know, uh, new financial instruments, uh, green uh, finance, you know, we need to have markets for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the Baltics, we need to develop them more to be able to, uh, to get uh, benefits of, of okay. uh, those financing. So I'll stop there for now. Yeah, if you can uh, click one uh, slide yeah. forward. Uh, and one more. Why, why was Finland on red there? I have ah, to. Very good. <laughs> very good. Yeah. So, uh, in environmental protection, yeah, in, in Finland there was um, the reds were in uh, resource productivity. I think I'll actually um, put it here. Uh, so, it was resource productivity was red for, for all countries. So, we need to work more on, on uh, you know, uh, uh, what to do with the waste management, recycling, you know, and, and uh, the material consumption. Uh, but then also for Finland, uh, in red was um, uh, air pollution uh, and uh, I think in energy intensity as well. So that's something to, um, mm -hmm. to think Good. about. How, how does it affect your uh, business decisions, uh, strategy, this comparison? We'll, we'll get to the Cisco. That's yeah. the, that was I'm, the intent. I'm an economist, you know. <laughs> so if you can click to the, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, very good. So uh, we see that the, uh, the in introductory statement by Leah has served the purpose to stimulate the discussion, which was exactly the intent. And uh, so the, the question for all of us and, and, and the, the audience, which is really the cross-section of public and, and private sector from across the region, is how do we make sense of multitude of, uh, of these policy initiatives, of the, uh, of 
the measurement initiatives, both at the policy level, at the industry level, and what does this actually mean for the corporates and, and for the financial institutions? How do we embed uh, embed these uh, these changes? And that's what we want to spend the, the next 30 minutes uh, discussing. Uh, how do we embed these measurements and the thinking at the institutional level? And I actually want to start out with uh, Esko um, Kivisari, the Deputy Managing Director for Finance Finland, who is actually one of the one of the lead, I believe, inspirations uh, for the uh, Finance Finland work on, on, on the industry level, uh, which is a, a nice publication on financial sector increases transparency in its climate work. So I actually want to start out with an industry level discussion, what this means for Finance Finland trying to take the multitude of these initiatives uh, forward and trying to embed at the institutional level. Uh, where are we now and uh, what to expect? I think we heard already from does it work? Yes. Uh, Risto Murto that, that there are difficulties in, in getting the information and having a good reporting to be the basis for business decisions. Um, our uh, Federation Finance Finland and its board has uh, established as one of its uh, strategic objectives to, to support uh, reaching Paris uh, agreement levels or, or let's say stay below. Rather we would, after ITCC report, we would like to stay below 1.5. Uh, yes, uh, and, and uh, as part of that, we started a project uh, looking at the indicators uh, for our members, and now we have published this recommendation for indicators to our members to report on uh, not all sustainability issues, but just climate issues. And uh, our indicators include what to do in, in investments, what to do in lending, uh, what to do with payment services, and what to do with, with uh, claims uh, prevention. Uh, in, in Finance Finland, we are not only banking, but we are also in insurance, and in insurance, the question. Yep. Oh, still still not working well. I, I get the message from the back row. Uh, the, we have an insurance also, and in insurance, uh, climate prevention is uh, actually, insurance is not about paying claims. It's, it's about preventing claims and then paying uh, compensation for those who suffer uh, something. But uh, we have now this recommendation in these four areas and, and we are expecting, uh, al although it's a recommendation, we are expecting our members uh, to really use it. What is really uh, encouraging in this area is that, for example, in this event, I, I'm seeing nobody questioning whether climate change is reality. Uh, I was last week in, in the US, in Washington DC, and, and uh, talking with actuaries, my, my profession, and every time somebody mentioned climate change, he or she had to start by saying that without uh, thinking in any way about the reason of climate change, we need to do this and that. Uh, I couldn't help but comment that uh, actuaries want to believe on science, but it sounds like uh, saying that if I drop this, it goes down. Uh, but I don't, I'm not saying that gravitation is true. So, uh, at least in Finland, it is clear that, that we, we all accept climate change as based on hard science and we try to act to avert the worst consequences of that. Thanks, uh, thanks, Esko. I would now want to um, go to uh, Yuka Honkanemi of uh, SEB Bank. And uh, knowing that the, uh, if you look at uh, one of the uh, measures, which is, for example, Dow Jones Sustainability Index in the category of uh, banks uh, across the Nordics, SEB has been recognized as the leader. Um, again, it's just one of the measures, uh, how to distinguish yourself. There are many others. But for, uh, for the audience, 
terms of uh, laymen, uh, if I may, how would you suggest to think of, uh, of this uh, world of impact measurement, the indicators, what to pay attention to, what not to pay attention to? Because that's, uh, although we, we heard during the first panel that the wishes for simplicity, for taxonomy, it's also very clear that uh, one, fit, uh, one size fits all will be very difficult to achieve. So what's your uh, take on this? Thank you. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index is the truth, as we <laughs> made it there. So that's <clears throat> that's uh, that's that's a good index. But uh, <clears throat> the fact fact of the matter is that it, it, we are we are we are looking at very complex world and, and complex changes that need to be implemented in an unprecedented, rapid way. And rearview mirror is uh, no help in looking at uh, looking at the uh, non-linear. Uh, rapid uh, disruptions that uh, multitude of industries, all, almost all industries, are facing. And so, <clears throat> so uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, you know, leading to this is that, like we heard in the previous, in the leading to the section about what banking industry is doing, and 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 uh, in the in the earlier earlier panel, I find it very helpful to to understand or to to explain this from the point of view that companies uh, have an impact on the planet and society. And uh, we, need to, we need to become better in both understanding that impact and influencing, uh, like Krista was saying, you know, working with our clients in terms of having more positive outcomes and mitigating the negative ones. So that is, that is one aspect. But then the other aspect is that the, all these disruptions that arise from the uh, events in planet and society are having an impact on the financial risks and financial values of companies and hence financiers of these companies. These are both perspectives on sustainability, but they are fundamentally different. They are not, they're not mutually exclusive, but it's quite important then to know that, okay, so if we want to measure something, what, what, which one are we talking about? Is it impact uh, to, the, to the planet or is it the disruptions impact on, on equity value and financial risks? Hopefully they converge, but, uh, but they, are, they are different things. Green bond is on the first one. G financing green initiatives, financing uh, transactions that provide uh, you know, um, good tools and investments for transition uh, uh, is, you know, measuring those uh, is, is, is about measuring the impact. TCFD, that's been mentioned many times, is about the latter. Uh, quantifying uh, probability of de default loss in the event of default or equity value uh, collapses, like Aristo was showing in the, in, the, in the coal industry, is about uh, the second part. These, these require different indexes, uh, but, uh, but uh, a lot more, lot more understanding on it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, this index sizing to very simple numbers, uh, uh, I'm afraid, uh, is, is, will not give us a silver bullet. We need, to, we need to become better in engagement. We need to become better in looking at the root causes and, and, and data elements there. And uh, there's a lot of, lot of work ahead, but I think that a lot of the work on the regulatory side and on the real business side will converge in terms of giving us data tools to understand it. We just need to make sure that we don't fix on static reporting indexes to understand dynamic developments that need to understand uh, develop, happen. Good. And uh, for some more reading, the Task Force uh, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures has been very active recently and I believe will continue to be similarly active. Um, this is the TCFD uh, acronym uh, that I guess we're all living in, uh, living in, this, uh, in this bubble. We're so used to the acronym that we forget to spell it out. So um, reminds me. Um, Going to the Nordic Investment Bank, and uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Igor Skasianos to step in. Um, Nordic Investment Bank, as uh, any other multilateral development bank, has been in the environmental, social governments, or ESG business for a very long time. Um, if you look at um, uh, EBRD, EBRD has said that by 2020, their uh, portfolio of climate-related investments will be 40% of new business. European Investment Bank uh, has said 
said that it will be 25 uh, percent over the, over the coming years, and and with, we see all of these targets increasing. What is the state of play at the Nordic Investment Bank in terms of thinking and uh, in terms of switching to some of these new taxonomies indicators and what uh, this means for for the work that you are doing? Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, just to, just to give the background, the Nordic Investment Bank is an uh, in international financial institution based here in Helsinki, and it's owned by the basically by the governments of, of Nordic Baltic countries. And uh, the, the, the the owners have given us as a vision of of a prosperous and sustainable region, and uh, the two instruments to to kind of pursue the vision, the mandates. So we have the mandate of uh, productivity gains and the mandate of environmental benefits and every time we are going out and uh, looking onto the projects that we could potentially finance we are looking through the prism of these two mandates and uh, uh, the Nordic Investment Bank has its own the so-called mandate rating framework or taxonomy if you will through uh, through which we assess the projects uh, how the projects fulfill uh, both of these mandates so we have a, a, a set of measures that we are uh, following and set of indicators the clients have to provide us before we can actually make the make the decision if the project uh, fulfills the the criteria and uh, basically there are three things i, I want to touch uh, upon it's the first one is the sustainability Mm, like the definition of the sustainability is very broad. I think I think everyone here has his own definition of sustainability. But uh, the thing I want to remind us, and actually that's a bit what Leah already touched, that it has a number of dimensions. Most of us understand the sustainability as the connection to the greenness to environmental side but as the same as we in nordic and western bank we see also that it has the other dimensions that is why we have the <clears throat> economic mandate the social mandate inside of it because if we look from the historic perspective we we have always done basically always up till now we have done the economic decisions based on economic value of it and kind of neglecting the environmental part of it now again, although we very welcome the, the, the process that has been initiated by the European Commission and Mr. Dombrovskis, we feel that it has tilted a bit too far again, only to, towards the environmental side, because this is the precisely right moment when the two parts of the sustainability, the economic part and the environmental part, cannot uh, cannot anymore phase out each other, but actually complement each other. And we see that it's, it's actually working now. And the other thing is, it's, 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 it's a bit more technical thing. We, we very welcome again the creation of the taxonomy and the work on the taxonomy. It's, it's highly needed because when you see how the, how the financial institutions are talking nowadays, it is not always clear what, what we're talking actually about. What is green, what is not green, what is brown, what is dark green, what is light green and so on. It is definitely needed. But then again, when we are talking about the ex, uh, about the impact uh, impact assessment, I would urge us to think in two dimensions. One is the ex ante analysis, ex ante information that we are trying to gather, and actually the financial sector is getting better at, at it. In the recent years, we have done a, a tremendous job in that, already <coughs> collecting ex ante data on the on the projects that we are going to finance. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is the ex post or the real, real results of those projects, and that's where I feel that we are trailing. And it's the same in the policy in the policy making. I don't think that we are having the emphasis enough on this. Okay. Uh, and I'm kind of afraid that at some point we will start to realize that there is a gap between the ex ante, so anticipated the results of our financing, and the actual results of it. And the third, third one is, <clears throat> irrespectively on how the taxonomy will play out, it will mean more information is needed on both sides. On the one side are the lenders or the bond issuers, on the other side are the clients. 
And at the bank, I'm the guy who's running around the region and meeting the clients and trying to assess their, their, uh, their projects. And I quite often get, still get the questions, why do you need these questions? Why do you need these indicators? What are you going to do with them? My house bank doesn't actually ask for them. So it will be crucially, really crucially, for the whole uh, sustainable finance uh, initiative to explain the initiative to the whole market, to the financial market, but also to the other side of it, the clients, mm -hmm. so they get the grasp of, of and understanding of this. So fantastic segue into getting down into specific banking institutions and what uh, all of these uh, changes that drive uh, means both uh, for the banks as lenders and for the banks as investors and the raisers of, uh, of capital. Actually, I want to first go to, um, uh, to our uh, Swedbank um, Estonia uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, our, uh, our representative uh, to to really drill down. If I if I look at the sustainability report for Swedbank for 2017, uh, on the lending side we see that uh, your portfolio is 42% in property management, and um, some other other sectors are are uh, far more dispersed. Can you talk us through where you are in journey uh, overall, and maybe in Estonia in 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 terms of uh, uh, implementing. Uh, and, and working with the clients on these issues that Mr. Kasyanovs mentioned, that uh, it's still very difficult to convince the clients or, or to get the message out there. So, Mr. Kit Flores is yours. Yes, hello. I'm from Estonia. Mm. I'm switch on without noticing the mute button, which is in the back of that small machine. I think you hear me now better, right? Um, once again, hello from Estonia. There are six direct flights uh, every day between Helsinki, Vanta and Tallinn airport. The earliest is six o'clock, so, and they all run on petrol fuel. So, um, very nice uh, morning wake up. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, in any case, ma many mentions have been done uh, uh, today in the conference towards complexity and uh, non-linear changes. A uh, small metaphor. Uh, historians figured out that there was a number of people died in Europe in 13th century. And uh, initially it was ascribed as, uh, as a plague or something. But then it figured out that sort of it, it wasn't. They basically died from starvation. Why? Because climatologists figured out there was extreme cold in Europe in the middle of 13th century. And then the next question was why? Because just it was cold day. Oopsie daisy. That's not scientific approach. So after many, many uh, months and years and many people and many of the European Science Foundation grants, they figured out that this was uh, a volcanic eruption in Indonesia happened, uh, uh, happened in large scale volcanic eruption that actually killed one island over there. And that's why those who have been uh, holiday destination close to Bali, they see volcanic islands over there. Uh, th that um, spread so much ashes to the atmosphere that it cooled down the whole Europe. Same thing happened in, in the beginning of 20th century. Um, economic consequences unknown, but uh, art consequences well known. Edvard Munch and, uh, and Scream. Hello, my Norwegian friends. So. That, that's the, the picture that depicts the, uh, the, the red sky is because of that. And of course, Eja Fjella Jökull, a couple of years ago uh, from Iceland. My point is that the complexity is nothing new. Volcanic eruption from faraway places, and presumably the inhabitants of uh, uh, Europe in 13th century had no idea of existing of Indonesia. Volcanic eruption basically killed our ancestors. So there is no sort of silver bullet that the complexity has always been there. And I'm very happy that Leia, uh, Lee, Leah pointed out the 17 uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Because you cannot really say that one is more important than the other one. Yes, it may be today or tomorrow, or it may be very important in, in certain sort of a political debate in certain election, but that's part of PR. You cannot really say that one is more important than the other one, and, uh, and, 
and sort of gender equality, for example, means less to us than climate change. No, it doesn't. And also having without water is, is also equivalently bad. So um, coming, coming uh, after this long conclusion, a long, long uh, introduction to Swedbank. So we are bank for many. We operate uh, uh, in, as a home market in four countries, Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. We have branches here and there, uh, including next to Stockman uh, here in Helsinki. But, uh, uh, but as a sort of retail bank, we are uh, having four home markets. And our market shares in all these countries are really large, ranging between 25 to 45. So it means that we are a bank for many. We are really a savings bank for many. We, uh, we keep people's assets. We lend them money to buy uh, new homes, washing machines, and cars, and, uh, and also to invest their pension savings. When we have these discussions, and uh, I know the Estonian figures, we have 50,000 client meetings per week. It's one country, one week, 50,000. 50, so I cannot really say that sort of people, people uh, are, uh, are uninformed or, or something of a kind. I think people are very well informed that having sustainable um, goals in their mind is, is something that takes them further. And, and what I mean in sustainable goals is uh, actually I, I think that things materialize when people connect uh, the slogans from conferences with real profits. And, and this one exactly happens that we, can, we cannot, I think Milton Friedman was completely wrong by saying that corporations shouldn't be engaged to um, corporate societal um, initiatives. I think he was alluding that corporates was more uh, supposed to look at three months profit results. But if you are, intend to have a profit also in 20 years, or if you are a domestic lender and uh, savings keeper for, for the whole nations, uh, then you actually do care if the society and their ability to pay back loans or uh, the environment, or we have a lot of forest customers in all home markets, the forests still exist in 20 years. So that's for me sustainability and that's quite hard rooted to the principle of thinking uh, of, of our customers uh, across, the, across the countries. And, uh, and uh, uh, to conclude, yes, the topic has been now more explicit. And I completely agree that we do ask many more questions, not in only environment, we ask many questions when it comes to transparency, transparency corporate governance, uh, everything. But it just makes the topic that has been there more explicit. And yes, maybe there are new traits as well uh, to speak, but um, I, I'm uh, quite positive that actually uh, this uh, short-termism determined by three month uh, quarterly reports is now turning to normal sort of existence hmm. of uh, uh, social environment. So do you have uh, any explicit targets? So we heard, for example, Varma, uh, our, our um, introductory speaker, if, if you noted, there was a, a uh, line on the presentation, long term, all of Varma's portfolio will be uh, climate friendly. Uh, no mention of a date. Um, we have some other institutions already on the uh, on the investment fund side operating with a claim 100% today uh, climate uh, climate friendly. Yes, uh, Swedbank, uh, uh, among other businesses, runs the Nordic largest asset management company, which is called Swedbank Robur, and. Uh, uh, um, Sustainable development has been all the time since Robur's uh, sort of inception in '69, uh, part of Robur's action, uh, including, uh, including but not limited to to environmental goals. But I think we, we, in last years we have taken it uh, much uh, much step further, and uh, we have introduced uh, uh, special funds, Ethic and Talenten, that invests. Mm -hmm. To uh, invest to the companies, where at least 15% of the uh, revenues is coming or investments are made uh, to the uh, aims that at le uh, are related at least one of the uh, one of the UN uh, so SDGs. SDGs. Okay. Okay. Sustainable Fantastic. Development Goals. So let me know. So, yes. 
there are explicit there are so I think this is something to take note and uh, uh, my, my belief uh, following all of this discussion is that these targets seem far and remote today um, but with the with the introduction of uh, of the European uh, measures they will uh, come to life uh, much much sooner um, than it might seem for all of us and actually a good good time to turn to Timo Petala head of um, capital uh, markets financing for OP financial group so you're actually at an intersection so you raise very long-term money to be used uh, for maybe shorter term investments and the same time being accountable uh, for uh, for the use so what are the discussions that you're typically in uh, on the investor side uh, what is the risk appetite and and the uh, and the focus on these aspects that you see yes thank you yeah OP is um, um, uh, operating fairly big banking uh, insurance and asset management uh, operations in Finland and also in the Baltics. So, therefore, all kinds of advances uh, in the sustainable finance area is very, we welcome that very much. So, doesn't function. Okay. As uh, uh, OP's uh, core uh, uh, value, sustainability has been there for the past hundred years. So, this is very natural for us to, to think on these lines. Uh, what's, what comes to the uh, uh, capital markets um, uh, area specifically, which, uh, I'm, which is my daily work, uh, we can see that um, I mean, we are spending much, much more time on these issues with our customers than we did for two, three, see, two, three years ago. So therefore, we can see that I mean, there's a clear shift in focus, a clear shift in focus on these issues. Um, and if, if you try to analyze where is this shift coming from, what has generated this issue, first of all, we are working in capital markets and we don't need regulation to change. This market is regulating itself, it's adapting uh, because there is certain demand. There is, uh, uh, and, and clearly this comes from the investor side. We see that investors are starting to ask much more uh, uh, disclosure. They they require much more disclosure. They 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 want to know much more about uh, uh, the investments they are making from the ESG side. So so therefore, I mean, this is uh, this is uh, clearly the, the the driving force. So uh, uh, and then when we talk to our issuer clients, Finnish corporates, for example, as we've stated here many times, they are good already. You know what comes to disclosure, but. Now they have to start to think uh, how to broaden the investment base into this new ESG investor base that have requirements that you need disclosure and that. So, so we are in the intersection there in the middle and trying to give advice to, to, to our corporate customers how to navigate in this new landscape. Uh, but there's one thing that I would like to, 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 to highlight here is that, um, I mean, obviously there's a huge political consensus that we want to regulate this market. Um, but as Risto Murdo said, we are at the very, very early stages yet there, and we are, we are just starting to, to, to realize what green is. And um, <coughs> the danger here is that, I mean, if we are getting binding le legislation before we, have, before we know what green is, bef before we know how, how green loans or how how green investments will affect banks' capital adequacy. It, it, it will bring us into an area, where, where unknown area, more or less. So, so, and therefore, I mean, what I would like to see is better definitions and better indicators for measurement before we can take the next step. That, that's, that's how I see it from the grassroots level when I'm talking to, 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 uh, uh, to, to investors and to, to our corporate customers and when I try to understand how a bank, how a traditional bank should navigate here. Mm -hmm. so I think an interesting perspective, if you put on a, a policy maker hat, one can say that the SDGs have been around for some time now. 
and the action has actually not been that fast. So uh, it's an easy solution to put something top down and then to see how ev everybody aligns. And, and um, the discussion that we see, at least from some of the policy uh, think tanks, is that they are also getting concerned that these volume targets, essentially on the investment raised, uh, will drive us in the in the wrong direction when it comes to the efficiency and effectiveness of the ultimate investments that will be will be made. Would be um, very keen to um, have Yuka's um, uh, perspectives on these aspects as you've been thinking about these issues uh, for quite a long time, and uh, what this actually means at a, at a bank and a portfolio level. Uh, are you putting these tasks on to uh, the industry specialists to now start thinking and integrating these aspects? Are you working? with some industry associations that they drive the change themselves to set these benchmarks. Um, so how to, how to marry the top to uh, bottom and, and the bottom to top approaches. Okay, <coughs> there's so many, many questions there. <coughs> I'll try to pick which one I answer. Uh, and the, um, uh, first, first of all, on the positive impact side, it's, uh, I think we were the first uh, Nordic uh, commercial bank to issue a green bond. So we do have volume targets in terms of loans that fit our green bond principles. Uh, we, we should 500 million said that we will, we will uh, uh, you know, aim to have uh, uh, roughly 2 billion euros worth of lending in, in a, uh, uh, by 2020 now. So that's uh, three, three years from the issuance. And, and uh, we, will, we will achieve that. But uh, <clears throat> uh, then the key question is that, is that lending volume coming because we did a green bond? And, and uh, <clears throat> it would be nice to say that yes, but the, but the honest answer is that no, not really. I mean, we are, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, quest, question is why isn't it more? Uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> so so uh, it's really that how do, we, how do we fuel investments, which is the EU target? How do we, how do we make sure that there, there should be two trillion more investments in green energy and green uh, uh, infrastructure in the next decade? And uh, this is, this is one piece of the puzzle uh, to make sure that finance industry would, would engage and would, would evaluate projects and, and, and do that. But, but it's, it's much, more, much more is needed from the corporate side. And I, I, I come back to this, maybe your, your question uh, number two was that we need to figure out how to price, uh, how to, how to price risks and, and uh, values in terms of forward-looking scenarios on companies. How to, what are, what, are the, what are the key disruptions for a particular industry and which companies within that industry are winners and, and, and losers? Are they engaging in the right way? And are we pricing the future in the right way? If we do that, then that, that will have a much, uh, uh, much swifter, uh, swifter impact. This is part of the EU game plan. This is, you know, uh, you know looking at the disruptions and how they, they impact value and risk. Um, but there's a lot more work needed to be done there on a standardization basis. If we do it our way, but nobody else does, then you know, hopefully we're right, but it doesn't yet move the market. There's, a, <clears throat> there's um, uh, you know, good initiatives uh, from the non-financial uh, reporting directive side that might you know, push the market uh, in, in terms of disclosure and, and looking at these disruptions and, and giving us more tools to work on. Um, but I think the industry as a whole needs to do a lot more work in terms of uh, understanding how to, how to price this into, into risk parameters. I think a question that's dear to ESCO's heart as well, you wanted to. Um, maybe, and then there are also comments to some of, of the discussion before. I mean, uh, in the high-level expert group, we certainly had other ideas than just climate change. It's the whole, whole ESG area, environment, society, and governance, and, and it was very much based on, on SDGs, the soft, uh, sustainability uh, development goals of the UN. But uh, it is uh, environment and especially climate change, uh, they are, it's, it's a concrete uh, area to be discussed. So uh, what with the recommendations and with the work continuing, with the taxonomy work, uh, the idea there is to start with, with environmental issues and, and define them first and then, then go to the other areas. That's a bit problematic, of course, 
because uh, it should then already start driving uh, investment decisions. And with the taxonomy, uh, the, the things supported should uh, support one of the, the good areas and not be against any of the others. So if the taxonomy is first on, on the environment area and then the others come later, at this stage you don't know what to do actually or your decisions might be against the later ones. Uh, which brings me to the second question that what can we do in regulation now in an area that is uh, changing quite fast? I mean, the science is changing uh, in the sense that we know more and more. 10, 15 years ago, I think you would have said that diesel cars are good uh, and now we are facing them out. Or you would, you, there was support for biofuels but uh, now we know that, that those are not the solution. With a long-term investor, that's a difficulty to, to know well in advance what, what to do. Uh, in, in Nordics, and, and uh, you will hear more of that of Joni Keron and there, we have the initiative to uh, have longer-term uh, binding targets for EU in, in uh, carbon emissions. And that would be a good step forward for all, all uh, long-term investors to, to really uh, plan ahead how to invest, how to do your business, uh, what to require from, from the companies you invest in. Uh, then, well, it was talk about benchmarks. Uh, benchmarks uh, and, and reporting were, of course, a topic highly debated in high-level high expert groups. There were uh, some uh, thoughts around there that you should forbid quarterly reporting because it takes uh, the incentives too short, or you, could, you should uh, regulate benchmarks so that you cannot have um, like weapons or, or tobacco in, in, in the benchmarks. Uh, we didn't re make recommendations to those directions, and I think it's good because the more information you have, the better always. Uh, Short-term information is not an enemy to long-term ideas, and benchmarks must reveal the reality, not, not, not what you wish for. Of course, it would be good to have uh, benchmarks that are ESG benchmarks, but uh, you will all the time also follow the whole market and, and, and try to do everything there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let me see if we have any, any burning questions from the audience before the break. Or we'll then be able to take them in the informal setting uh, during, uh, during the, the break. Let me see if any uh, one of the panelists wants to have a, a, a final say on any of the topics. Uh, I think this is very much a, a long journey and, and the one thing is clear that many more initiatives will be coming and the speed of uh, the introduction of these initiatives will be uh, quite uh, quick and uh, I believe there is also a particular uh, reason for the uh, for the uh, really the transformational power of the financial sector that the financial sector has been chosen as the transmission channel for these policy discussions and the task is really on all of the financial sector sector players uh, to figure out the best way of engaging with the with the corporates, with the households, and, and making this transition. So I uh, want to ask all of you to say thanks to, uh, to the panelists for the tremendously insightful discussion. And we will now uh, proceed to um, to the panel, uh, sorry, to uh, to the break, uh, where we have uh, our four um, uh, four networking partners: uh, the, the uh, Flycap, SG Capital, Labif, and uh, ZGI out there, um, who are the venture capital and private equity representatives from across the Baltics uh, for some discussions. Thanks a lot. Very happy to see uh, to be here and to see uh, so many of you still here. It's been a long morning, uh, so thank you very much for staying on. 
Um, we have heard a lot of perspectives on what sustainability means in the financial markets. Uh, we heard the regulator's view in the morning, also the legislator's view, and many of the practitioners' views. I thought that by, by this time uh, of the day, um, I have to bring something new on the table and uh, just thought uh, to share with you one dimension what the banks also do, which is to do research on sustainability. Most people uh, already believe uh, and, and of, or have captured this uh, IPCC report and don't doubt the climate change anymore. Uh, however, when talking to corporates and, and investors, which we do a lot, uh, what you kind of sense and hear is that people understand that this is real, this is important, I need to do something, but how can I relate to this in my daily work? And that is a kind of a challenge that many people are, are facing. So cutting down your uh, how much you eat meat seems a little bit of a smallish thing to do, especially if you are investing and making big decisions during the day. Uh, so for these uh, potential uh, uh, people who might still be in doubt, uh, our research has, has made uh, some studies on what's the financial relevance of ESG. And here's only two pictures. Uh, uh, and uh, we can see that we, was this return on equity or uh, share performance, uh, the difference uh, between the best rated in terms of ESG, in this case we have been using MSCI ratings, and the worst performers, uh, there's a huge difference here. So this can be an indicator uh, for making decisions as an investor. Of course, for asset managers, it also could be a competitive edge uh, uh, investment strategy. Uh, in the middle ground, and of course during the time, it's not always as clear, and uh, the challenge in the whole area here is how to, or what to use as uh, the reference point for what is uh, sustainable, what is good ESG performance. We have so many different uh, ways to define that, and um, uh, the, for example, MSCI has been doing it for a long time, but still the methodology uh, doesn't go um, back uh, too long uh, to, to provide real comprehensive data. But we, we are seeing some signs. Also, um, more uh, quite strong as well is this volatility. Uh, the better performance in your ESG, you tend to have less volatility. And uh, uh, this, I. Uh, some of you have seen my slides before, but this you haven't seen. Uh, and uh, just added here with uh, gender diversity. Since we are in the Nordic countries and Baltics, we should be the leaders here. Uh, there was some uh, uh, attempt uh, by our colleagues to see if there's any, any correlation with the share performance of the companies. They concluded that there doesn't seem to be during this time on either direction. However, uh, if you have more board members, um, uh, female board members, um, then you tend to have also more female managers in the company. So there's a clear correlation. It's kind of a no-brainer, but still. Uh, what is uh, the interesting part here is um, that um, the less diverse management teams, the companies that have less diverse management teams, had clearly bigger volatility in terms of return on capital employed. And the volatility is something that drives uh, valuation and is relevant for investors. So thank you, something for you to think about. Uh, here's an example of how investors, what investors nowadays want to know. So this is uh, the impact of our green bond. This is what you want to show, how much uh, uh, greenhouse uh, house gases were saved, what was the impact on water capacity and things like that. Uh, so only few selected relevant points. And then the SDGs are also aware for, for those who are interested in those. Uh, this we have seen already, the growth of uh, the tremendous interest from the investors and commitment to responsible investment uh, practices, growth of green bonds and the growth of various ways of uh, defining and giving guidance on what is sustainable. It, it starts to be a little bit of jungle and difficult to navigate, and many corporates say, that's, okay, what should I report to? It's so difficult. How can I know what is relevant and what is not? Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we are seeing um, 
that uh, regulators have started to do their first um, initiatives and, and the first legislative uh, proposals came out in May, as explained by Mr. Dombrovskis in, in this morning. And uh, also the action plan uh, and the reasoning for doing that uh, is of course growth, uh, long term is uh, transparency, uh, make, taking care of, of that we go towards the right direction and everyone, everybody has an adequate understanding uh, and possibility to, uh, to see where we are. But also this systemic risk issue, which uh, Maria Nykänen also mentioned in the morning, uh, establishing this connection that climate change and environmental issues may have systemic risk impact means that it falls into the responsibility of the financial regulators. Uh, and uh, the, the only conclusion of this is that uh, sooner or later something will come out uh, from them as well. Uh, the action plan uh, by the Commission is here uh, and uh, those who are interested and go and, and, and Google it, uh, if, if, but I think that most of you have already done that. Uh, uh, why I put this on now, uh, since I'm a member of a technical expert group, I thought you could be interested um, to hear a little bit uh, of what it is. I picked up some questions. I try to remember those now. Um, First, there was the question of TCFD and how to integrate that into the non-financial information. Uh, the directive on the disclosure on non-financial information uh, and the non-binding guidance by the uh, EU Commission is up for review next year. And one subcommittee of our technical expert group is working on those and how to integrate the TCFD climate change uh, information into the guidance uh, of the non-financial directive, <coughs> non-financial information directive. So uh, that uh, hopefully will help uh, to, to make this happen on the corporate level. Uh, that of course implies to all sectors, not only only financial sector. And uh, for us in the financial sector, uh, the fundamental cornerstone for our reporting is of course that uh, corporates have to report first. Uh, we, we should not be inventing <coughs> the figures of our portfolio. At the moment, all reporting from the financial sector, let's say from carbon uh, footprinting, has to be based on, on uh, estimations uh, done by um, various experts and, and consultants because there is not enough comprehensive uh, real data. So companies have to step up in that, and I'm sure they will. Then uh, I think there were some other questions on, yes, on the technical part. Here are the six objectives that the taxonomy will define. The first two, the climate change mitigation and adaptation uh, will take form by next June in the report that we take will, will publish. And then the following four will be defined by 22-23. So this is going to be a long walk. And uh, at the same time, there's a lot of these voluntary frameworks that are already in use, that will continue to be in use, and uh, a combination of these two uh, will probably will have to prevail. I'm the rapporteur for the Green Bond Standard uh, subgroup in, in this uh, uh, TEG, and uh, the uh, uh, are also looking in how to give guidance uh, on how to use this taxonomy in the green bond world and, and also take into account this interim period. Uh, so this is uh, more or less what, what I was thinking of, of saying uh, of this, uh, maybe the technical development, uh, a note of that. Uh, it's often said that how can we define anything because the technique uh, is going so fast. Actually, it's not going so fast. The renewable, renewable energy technology that has been there started to be developed decades ago. So what we are today aware of is already uh, on the tables of the R&D uh, departments and, and the, the academias. Uh, however, in, for the purpose of this taxonomy, uh, what is defined here now, uh, or in, in this technical expert group, uh, Commission has said that they are happy to take 
input from industries who think that they have also green technologies which have not been included. These industries should highlight these directly to Commission and then they will be updated into the taxonomy. So it's going to be a living document how often the update happens. We don't know the, the whole platform uh, who is going to run this doesn't exist yet. But the thinking is there that it's going to be an evolving thing, as it has to be. It's true that we go ahead, uh, but sometimes we have to be careful not to make this technological development as a hurdle for sort of not starting to do something. Uh, all the technology that we need to mitigate climate change is already here, so no excuses. Uh, now, uh, before we go into a panel, we have one more uh, presentation from OP Pohjola uh, Corporate Bank, Lena Kaasinen, will uh, bring us a little closer to the actual world of, of uh, issuing green bonds and uh, what does it mean uh, to, to do it in practice. Okay, can you hear me? Thank you, Ailam. Thank you to see you all, all here after, after uh, this time of the day. So uh, we heard a lot about um, uh, regulation and, uh, and uh, legislation around the sustainable finance. So my approach is a bit more practical side. And, uh, and uh, well, um, let me just, okay. Well, my uh, first thought was to uh, give you a brief introduction of, of our group. However, I think uh, my colleague Timo Pietila already gave you a short brief, uh, short brief of, of our group and our, our um, uh, different approach to the, uh, since, we are, um, since we are fully owned, owned a cooperative financial group, so we have a, our roots are very deep in, in the society. So, so we feel that sustainability is, is, is uh, approach that we have, be, we have been elaborating for a long time. However, uh, in terms of sustainable finance, I think there are a lot to be done. So, um, and, and we need to keep, uh, want and need to develop product and services that will uh, en encourage our, our clients and customers to, uh, in a responsible manner, towards the uh, environmental environment and climate. So, um, I think um, in terms of, uh, of the market perspective, uh, I'm, I'm uh, on the DCM side, which means we, we have uh, discussions with, with the investors and with the clients. So how could they, uh, how could they uh, put sustainability into their funding, funding perspective and funding needs? And I think uh, we've been talking about a lot of uh, sustainable finance and, and green bonds. However, I'm not quite sure if we ever got there, what are actually green bonds? So green bonds are any type of uh, bond instruments that enables raising capital for new or, or existing projects with environmental sustainable finance, uh, sustainable benefits. For example, this can be um, renewable energy projects or, or with um, green buildings with, a, with an uh, international recognized um, certificates. Uh, what's different from, from uh, what makes the uh, green bond different from, from normal bond is that the funds that uh, will be raised through green bonds are earmarked and allocated uh, to these environmentally sustainable, sustainable projects. And uh, as you can see, there are also sustainable bonds uh, which uh, will raise raise uh, monies towards sustainable sustainable um, with projects which have a clear positive social outcomes, so, such as uh, social housing, healthcare, and, and education. And in addition, there are also sustainability bonds, which are, are a combination of, of these two. So uh, a bond that raise uh, finance uh, the bond that finance projects that are have a clear positive environmental impact and alleviate social issues as well. So, what's the rationale behind 
the cream bonds. Uh, well, at first there can be different reasons to, to issue green bonds, but however, I think those are very closely linked to these, these two aspects, so responsibility aspect and, and funding aspect. And for example, for us, we just, uh, I forgot to mention that we, we just launched our green bond framework uh, a week ago, and been, uh, we've been uh, seeing investors across the Europe regarding the framework. So, so for us as a, as a financial group, the funding aspects is of course very important to us. So we, we want to diversify the funding sources and expand our investor base. However, we do, do, do recognize that it, it also highlights the corporate responsibility and, and, and uh, strengthens our commitments in, in the ESG, ESG related topics. And uh, then we can actually go to the actual practicalities regarding issuing green bonds. Um, the ICMA created these green bond princip principles uh, to help to structure the framework and, uh, and to build it so it would be very transparent for, for investors to understand what the issuers are actually doing. The framework can be uh, seen as a four parts of of these two, so use of proceeds, project evaluation and selection, management of proceeds, and, and of course reporting. And uh, these are, and yeah, okay, so if we start at the, at the, at the use of proceeds, so the one on the, on the, on the upper side of the, of the right side, right, right hand side. So the all designated green project categories should uh, provide a clear environmental benefits. Uh, the green bond principles have recognized 10 different uh, categories. And then for example, in our case, uh, we have uh, identified six different categories that would be included in, in our, our framework. Those are renewable energy, energy efficiency, green buildings, pollution prevention, sustainable land use and clean transportation. So the, what, that's, what does this mean is that we can include projects that are in line with these, these kind of uh, uh, categories. And so for issuers, these are the main, main important things for them if, uh, when, they are, when they are issuing no green bonds because they, they need to, of course, um, um, find the relevant use of proceeds for, for them. And then you can, uh, you have to also um, define the internal process for the project selection. So what's the actual process for when you are, when you are selecting, selecting the assets? And uh, from my experience, I, I think this, and from OPE perspective, I think this is the, one of the key areas for us that we, uh, we have learned, where we have learned a lot, because um, this process for us, it's sort of has forced us to uh, do more comprehensive collaborations between the business units, uh, treasury and ER and, and sustainability. So this project has most, uh, most certainly opened our eyes in, in many ways. And uh, then uh, there are also, also part of uh, management of the proceeds. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, that the, although the green bonds are, are any type of uh, uh, project, uh, any type of bonds, the, uh, the proceeds should be earmarked. So then you need to define an actual uh, process and, and, uh, and uh, tell how you would, um, how you would, uh, how the earmark would be would be done. Thank you. And of course, uh, the reporting is is one important part of of the green bond. And as Ayla mentioned uh, and showed how Nordea, what is the Nordea's way to do it. So um, I think the most most um, or the best way is to do it to, is to be more transparent. And of course, there are many of indicators where where you can uh, find the best way how, how to, 
uh, how to communi communicate the, the actual actual um, uh, actual um, environmental benefits of of, it, of the of your bond. And uh, one one thing to mention, I know I'm 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 going over my my time, but um, uh, there is also an external review. We call it second party opinion that is uh, necessary to to go overlook the the framework and and all the parts of it. So uh, they are basically doing the ESG performance assessment for the issuer, uh, and and also go look at uh, uh, at the project ca categories. But shortly, no shortly, no pressure. Shortly, so in market wise, uh, the green bond market has grown rapidly. Uh, there are issues across the uh, across the sector, and uh, majority of the the green bonds are are from the corporate sector. However, there are banks also issuing green bonds more and more, and uh, hopefully we will also get get there when the time comes. And I'm uh, more than happy to see that there the Nordics are leading the green bond markets. There are still few issues. Uh, there could be more issues from um, from Finland, and hopefully we will we will see more issues further further on. So thank you. Thank you, Lena. So the topic, and thank you, Lena. And, and the topic of our panel was to go into a bit more concrete level of, of uh, how this is done and what sustainability means uh, for corporates and what kind of vehicles we have. And we thought that we would first take a little bit of this capital market uh, public listed company view and start uh, with Nasdaq. And um, Lauri Rosendahl, who is the president of Nasdaq Nordic, uh, I hope uh, you can give and explain uh, us some of the fantastic examples on, on how to contribute to this ESG and, and understanding in, in the market. Uh, I believe you have done something that hasn't been done anywhere else, or at least done it first. And that is, of course, uh, always uh, fantastic to, to tell about. So please. Thank you, Ayla. And, and thank you for the <coughs> invite. I'm really happy to be here. At the same time, I really feel the responsibility here uh, that uh, we uh, on the panel here, we are the last thing between you and lunch. So I'm going to be really efficient and fast uh, with a couple of comments in terms of what an exchange operator can do when it comes to sustainability and what we are doing in, in practice. So this is kind of a market practitioner's comment to the agenda. Um, but shortly as a background, Nasdaq in the Nordics operates seven exchanges in seven countries. So that's here in Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Iceland. Um, and as an exchange operator, we are of course very proud that we come out, usually when it comes to ESG reporting rankings, typically we come out at the top. Um, and, and just uh, a couple of weeks ago at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva, we were awarded as part of the UN Sustainable uh, Stock Exchange Initiative an award for the Helsinki Exchange in terms of, of uh, leading ESG reporting. However, it's important to remember it's our listed companies that do the reporting and they are really great and we then get the award. So I like that kind of. <laughs> Uh, but but it, that's the core of my first point. When it comes to ESG reporting, we are in a fantastic place in the Nordic countries already. Uh, we have great companies that are, do a good job in that respect. Uh, and, and I think that that's what is the first thing that public markets can do, nudge corporates forward, because transparency, which, which is what public markets are all about, right? To give investors the proper information. Uh, and there, I think that the transparency that we can push companies to do to keep in investors informed is part of the bridge building between what investors, especially professional institutional investors, don't want to have a lot of sustainability information, what we can do to build that bridge between the corporates reporting on ESG and the, what the investors need. There's a lot to do, by the way. In, in that area in particular, building that bridge, because it's a jungle on both sides, and it sometimes seems that people don't speak the same language where corporates are reporting EEG and what investors actually need as information for their investment decisions. But the Nordic companies do a lot of, of, of good work there. However, just a short anecdote, uh, when you say that we are doing great ESG reporting, we have 
In the Nordic region, 1,010 listed companies. I think there was a new listing in Stockholm today, so maybe it's 1,011 today. Um, but out of those, only 170 companies are large cap companies, market capitalization more than 1 billion. Out of those 170, more, actually 90% today report on ESG. So they are like home free, right? So the job is done. But the remaining 840, mid-sized companies, small companies, we have this junior market first north uh, in our countries, 840 companies, only 10% report on ESG. And that, I think, is one of the part where uh, NASDAQ feels an obligation to really help these companies on the road towards more sustainability reporting and better transparency on that side. Because we truly believe that there will be a day where investors will require appropriate ESG information to be even able to invest in these companies. And for these companies to be able to attract capital, which is essential for, for us. Uh, of course, to run a competitive market, help our companies that the day they need capital, they need to be able to attract that. And what does that take in a kind of a future sustainable world? So that's what we're doing. We have our ESG reporting guide out. We are working on 2.0 that will be out next spring, taking in TSCFD and uh, sustainable development goals and so forth. We run a pilot program with the small companies, uh, helping them on the road into ESG reporting. And that's been really successful. We, and actually, we had the most of the companies from Finland, but in total, 36 companies were on the program. And we are likely to run a new program next year, again, to help more companies uh, get on board. So that's the reporting side. Then when it comes to um, sustainable bonds, uh, it's, it's funny to say that actually we started the world's first market for sustainable bonds in 2015. It's only three years ago. <coughs> Um, and now we have more than 100 listed bonds there. And it's like 95 of them, I think, is in Sweden. So the other Nordic countries can pick up a bit there. Um, and uh, the outstanding capital is more than 7 billion. And uh, you can always, you know, when you have these 180 billion targets and so forth <laughs> for the sustainable uh, investments needed, uh, you can say that 7 billion is not that much in, in, in euro terms. but. It actually represents on our corporate bond market, it now represents 10% of the outstanding stock of corporate bonds on our market. And that to me is like, okay, we are getting somewhere. It's already 10%. And, um, and the fantastic situation after having now 100 bonds on the market is that we still have over demand. We have a lot of earmarked money, especially with the leading Swedish institutions, pension capital, that they are they want to invest more in green bonds, uh, social bonds, um, and we don't have enough supply. So if there are any issues out there, you know, thinking about should we put out a green bond and is it really cumbersome and all that, um, we're getting good feedback that it's not that cumbersome, it's not the admin burden, it's not that bad, and uh, there is really, really plenty of demand. So I think that that, will, that market will continue to grow, and I'm really happy about the steps that we are doing there, also introducing a, a, a sustainable bond market here in Finland this year, uh, getting Kuntarahotus municipality here on board on that. Uh, we have also introduced the first north sustainable bond market means that non-IFRS companies, including municipalities, can list bonds without doing IFRS that you need to do on a kind of exchange market um, and so forth. And we actually have a retail segment in Sweden for sustainable bonds. Uh, where we already have one listed bond where there's actually electronic order book trading for retail so that they can uh, buy and sell that bond uh, anywhere, anytime they like. Uh, last comment, sustainable investment products. Uh, there was a discussion about benchmarks and we introduced an ESG responsible benchmark index on the Swedish uh, S30. Big index in Sweden, really highly traded and uh, with a extended uh, and a quite big derivative market. That we, the, we introduced the index in July, and now in October we introduced a index future based on that benchmark index. And to me it was like, yeah, sure, of course we need to have an ESG benchmark index um, done in the right way. It's an exclusion index so far, not kind of, we'll, we'll get to the positive impact in indices as well. Uh, but then to put out uh, an index future to me was like, yeah, of course we need to do that. 
And then again, when we were about to announce that, it was like, okay, this is the first in the world in terms of having an ESG benchmark index on the ba basic benchmark of the mar of a full market. So there's a lot to do, and we are pushing, the, of course, uh, the agenda here in terms of getting more and more products out. I think we, need, we will have a couple of other new products within the next quarter. Uh, so I think we need to push the envelope in terms of new investment products, benchmarks. And then we are working very closely with a lot of issuers in terms of getting more sustainable-based products, be it ETFs, certificates, notes, and so forth, into the market. And that is the way we keep our Nordic markets in the lead on this agenda team, because my concluding remark is that I think that this is the biggest mega trend in investing that we will have over the next three to five years. And I've been saying that already for three to five years. So, so I, I think it, it's, it's building, and I'm so glad that it's coming bigger and bigger. Thank you. Thank you very much for very encouraging words. For words. So uh, the most important trend in investing, 10% out of all bonds are green bonds. <laughs> And a lot of new uh, benchmarks and other products coming up, uh, really, really promising. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Setting the scene in, in such a positive way. Uh, I would like now to um, ask Joachim Holmström, uh, the head of capital markets in municipality finance. You, ha you are an experienced bond issuer, uh, and uh, also you have issued your first green bonds, and you are also a lender to the municipality sector. So what aspects you would like to add to this discussion now? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Ayla. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm using this one. <laughs> Clearly works. So yeah, I, I would agree with what uh, uh, Laura just said. We see tremendous interest uh, from the investor community. This is clearly a, a growing market, and that we can see now in Finland, I guess, looking from an issuer's perspective, um, looking globally, I think Finland uh, Nordics are clearly, let's say, forerunners uh, in a global context. But then if we compare within the Nordics, I think uh, Sweden has been the, the leading country and now Finland is slowly but surely uh, catching up. And I guess events like this is, uh, is doing the, the right thing, raising awareness, uh, lesson learned to other issuers how, how, or investors, how should they approach uh, this, uh, this market of uh, sustainable uh, investing. So, uh, yeah, Munifin, uh, we were the first uh, Finnish issuer to issue a green bond uh, if we don't take into account uh, Nordic Investment Bank, which is like a supranational, but purely only a Finnish, as a Finnish uh, issuer, uh, we were the first one. I, think, I remember the first meetings from 2009 with uh, Christopher Flensbody from SCB when he was uh, pitching the green bond idea to Munifin. And back then, we were a slightly different uh, organization. Our borrowing needs much, were much, much smaller. And it wasn't really, uh, uh, let's say, relevant at that time. But as our importance for the whole public sector uh, finances uh, since the start of the financial crisis increased, uh, uh, we, we saw a, a, a quite a good business opportunity here. We knew that. The assets we have in our uh, balance sheet, that is uh, loans to, to local government uh, infrastructure investments, as well as to the public housing sector, would meet uh, the, these uh, criteria for sustainable investments. We started uh, to drafting our green bond framework uh, in, in 2015. Uh, and then in 2016, we finally then uh, issued our first uh, green bond. Uh, but before that, uh, we had already launched a green uh, loan product to our customers. Our choice at Munifin was not to, let's say, dig through our balance sheet and see, uh, say, refinance old investments. Our approach was to only focus on new investments. So we, early 2016, uh, uh, we, say, brought forward this uh, green, green uh, loan product. Uh, which was directed then to renewable energy investments or uh, energy efficiency, uh, public transportation, uh, wa waste and wastewater management. Uh, this product was uh, really well received by our customers. 
uh, and we saw a, a quite a big and rapid growth in, in the asset pool. And today we have uh, 1.2 billion euros of uh, green assets in our lending book, and this is, is uh, constantly growing. Our responsibility strategy, uh, we have a clear goal, uh, which is perhaps not as ambitious as EIB, but we want to have 15% of our lending book in uh, green assets by 2025. So this is something that we are uh, very much uh, focused on. Uh, I mentioned this uh, huge demand from our customers, and we're also uh, giving incentives to our customers to raise awareness on, on this uh, important topic of uh, uh, environmental. Uh, to the environmental topics are actually providing a discount in margin for green loans. So, so our customer actually gets cheaper funding for a green investment than for a brown or a black investment. This is uh, also done to compensate for the extra work which is required when you take up a, a green loan from Unifin because we in turn owe our investors that we need to report on what is the impact we are making on, on, on the environment. We, we publish an annual uh, impact report uh, where we uh, publish how much uh, CO2 reductions we've done, how much energy has been saved in megawatt hours. And then, in turn, our investors can, can use, uh, use that for, for their own re re reporting uh, purposes. Uh, we're, but we're also, not only on the lending side, we're also on the liquidity management and, and, and investing side. We're uh, integrating ESG in, into to our evaluation criteria. So not only credit risk and yield and, uh, and the maturity is count, but uh, more and more ESG uh, rating, so we rate our uh, liquidity portfolio based on ESG, and we actually make investment decisions accordingly. So if uh, presented with an investment opportunity, if uh, the ESG rating doesn't meet our internal uh, criteria, we will uh, not be investing in that, uh, in our liquidity uh, portfolio. So that is, say, uh, what we are doing currently in, in this larger, field of uh, SRI investing. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of good, good examples. First of all, uh, you have a clear target of what part of your issuance will be green. 15% uh, is, is ahead of what, uh, what is the market average, even in the best uh, market. And uh, also, uh, you have a comprehensive approach to this uh, asset, also uh, taking it, uh, ESG into account in your liquidity portfolio but also a very good example of how this green bond, which is in a way a small part of a big, bigger bond market, which is still a small part of a total financing market, um, can influence uh, the other sectors because, as you said, you will need to ask for further reporting from your uh, borrowers and uh, by that make them more aware of, of what is green and what kind of uh, impact reporting is needed and also uh, understand their uh, challenges to, to put resources for this reporting and compensate that in, in the loan. So uh, that is uh, something, uh, something to, to note. Uh, very good, thank you so much. Uh, then I would like to go over to uh, her here again, a bit more uh, practical experiences. Paulus Churauskas, uh, uh, SCB, uh, Head of Capital Markets in the Baltic area. And uh, now I, uh, the, the more we go uh, into this panel, uh, it starts to get more and more difficult to say something that hasn't been said uh, before, but I'm sure you can think of something. So please go ahead. Thank you, Eva. And, uh, great pleasure to be here in, in this event. And actually a lot of uh, useful takeaways and reflections from the first two, two panels and sessions. And if I allow myself to reflect a little on the, on the first one, uh, primarily the reason I, I was raising a hand and I was optimistic in terms of uh, that we, the, we in this part of the world, we can actually make the impact, despite the fact that we're only 1.2 billion from the 7 billion population. And uh, one of the reasons and, uh, is that uh, 
financially, uh, we are much more powerful because if you combine the balance sheets of uh, financial institutions and also the assets and the management from asset manager portfolios, in the Western world, we actually can make the difference. And uh, the, the, the ways how we route those assets to, to finance uh, businesses also in emerging markets is uh, we have influence. And the good news is Asia and uh, China has uh, very rapidly become number one uh, green bond place uh, in the world. Bad news is Mr. Donald Trump and uh, he is not on this camp. Uh, hopefully, uh, his, his tenor is, is uh, soon about to end, so, so we will have more friends in the Western world to follow the route. Now, on the, on the regulatory side, um, obviously, we as a, as a financial institutions, we are not necessarily always the very big fans of, of more regulation, and uh, we are wrestling with you currently. But uh, on this one, I'm actually very optimistic because I believe that uh, it can definitely encourage uh, uh, positive developments, the way financial institutions use the balance sheets, and also the way asset management uh, incorporates sustainability in the, into their mandates. So I think this one uh, is, is, is really making a positive impact to, to, to the development. Now, uh, uh, being responsible for, for the capital markets business in, in the Baltics, and we have been involved in the most of the green bond situations in, in the Baltics, including state-owned utilities like Latvenergo or, or Latvos Energia, uh, also including uh, state development uh, institution uh, Altum, and Elina has a big credit for this, uh, being here in this conference. So proud to be involved in those, and uh, as the originator, uh, I must say that uh, we love green bonds, not only not only because I, we represent the, the bank uh, that has uh, sustainability in, in, into the bone, into the DNA, and also that we, we have uh, in, in our investment uh, banking um, arm, we have a very powerful sustainability team consisting of nine people focusing on that. And uh, I think uh, we also have a bit of selfish reason. Uh, Simply, green bonds are easier to execute, and uh, we love it. And uh, you know, uh, we also obviously do not, not green stuff. And uh, this statement is also very interesting because I feel a bit shy to say this in this conference, in this panel, and uh, being uh, maybe less ambitious than Lowry in two, three years' time, maybe five to ten years' time, in similar conferences, I think it would be even more difficult to say that we do non-green. So I think this is a one-way train and this is where it's heading actually, very clearly. Now, as the originators, uh, and the reason, again, why we love green bonds so much, I would like to focus on a couple of uh, aspects. Obviously, there are much more, but uh, one is, uh, you know, financial return discussion versus uh, sustainability. And the other one is uh, borrowing costs, funding costs, and how, how those uh, are interlinked with each other. So on the first one, I think we have a bit of the old, uh, old dogma and the old misconception that uh, they actually contradict to each other. And uh, I would strongly argue that uh, it's rather not, because sustainable, uh, and this, is, this old dogma, I think, is coming from, from old days where, where uh, technology solar wind technology was way behind uh, uh, in terms of effic efficiency and in, in energy production, way behind uh, the, the, the classical uh, fossil fuel based uh, facilities. So this is one, but I think also uh, what we, there is a lot of empirical evidence currently on, on, on that one. And uh, for example, we are uh, using rating agencies as a, as a tool to, to, to assess credit risk. In, in this this world, the financial world, and uh, uh, there are many uh, examples where we, for example, if you focus on the amount of downgrades or, or upgrades of rating, it's very highly interlinked these days to the long-term sustainability. So eventually, it, it means that being more sustainable, you are less risky, and uh, this is very important in, in uh, for, for the borrowers. And uh, you know, 
our mission in, in, in capital markets is actually to connect borrowers with, with investor community. So this is one, and then uh, focusing on the, on the borrowing costs, uh, and this is uh, the very typical conversation that you would have with the, with the borrower uh, when you discuss uh, the dilemma to do a green versus a, a regular bond. Uh, and uh, the thing is that how much will I save in the economy in terms of basis points, 10, 20, or 30 basis points? And uh, the thing is that there is no, no magic, there is no uh, crystal, crystal ball to tell, and this is much more delicate in discussion. But I can name a few reasons and uh, a, a few practical, um, practical experiences. Uh, I think this is especially relevant in debut situations. This is especially relevant in debut situations like let was energy, like what Venergo we, we, we experienced. Very relevant in situations where, where the borrower wants to extend the maturity profile, where he wants to access longer tenors. Uh, and, and also uh, uh, very relevant when you have less uh, reliance on the home turf, when you want to go outside your local space, when you try to target international investor community. So for example, with the debut that was Energia offering, we had 130 investor accounts in the deal from 25 countries, including Canada, Taiwan, and Korea. Obviously without doing much of the marketing in, 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 in these, these ones. So again, I think this is quite, quite clear, clear evidence and uh, uh, why it's beneficial to the borrow, borrower community. Now, Focusing on the investor community, I think very similar is, is, is still valid. And I think what is even more relevant is the, is the peer pressure. So now we have uh, more than $80 trillion of, of money in the management that have committed to, to principles of responsible investment. Uh, and I think the investor community in dialogues with their stakeholders, we will always face the question, why not there? you are not there yet, right? So, so, so you, you don't want to also be, to, to, to be not in the train, and the train is on the rails, there is, it's one-way traffic, I think, I'm a strong believer that this will continue, and uh, you are not in the game uh, if, if you miss the train, both if you are a borrower or if you are the, the investor. Thank you. That was a very uh, good account for all the benefits that there could be uh, included in issuing green. Uh, there's a lot of demand, but it's uh, also for the issuer uh, a great way to expand your investor base, which is always positive for a treasurer. And thank you for bringing up the international angle also to this discussion. Uh, that is something that we have also heard when in our green bond standard developing discussions in, in the TEG uh, that Chinese have said that make a good taxonomy, we will copy it. And uh, so um, it's not that uh, being a leader uh, in any area would be negative for Europe, it's on the contrary. And, and uh, I think we, uh, and this panel is, is proving the point in a very, very nice, nice way. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we will have any time for discussion in the end, uh, but I still want to go through all the panelists since I think that you are answering in your, your uh, presentations and discussions already many of the questions that I would anticipate that many in the audience are already thinking. Uh, now we have captured the sort of bond market quite a lot and the capital market side, and I would like uh, to ask um, EIB, Eric Yelstad, uh, to go more into the loans and, and uh, the smaller companies and institutions that could not be for size reasons or for, for other reasons eligible or, or for the bond market or who don't want to access that. And what can you do uh, to um, help them? And also a thing that uh, I faced and, and I've heard some of the other institutions saying that there starts to be a shortage of eligible assets, what you can find us. Uh, how does it look like from your point of view? Thank you so much, uh, Ayla, and uh, thank you for the invitation, or, or rather, I should say, on behalf of my friend and colleague, uh, Alexander Stubb, who was initially invited here, but uh, as you may know, uh, Alex is on leave of absence and has dealt with some other issues the last couple of weeks, so uh, he asked me to step in, step in, which I'm highly grateful for. Thank you. 
So uh, EIB, uh, the world's largest uh, international financial institution based in this highly energy efficient climate smart building in Luxembourg, uh, I thought it was uh, good fun to put that uh, on. Uh, and indeed, it is a highly climate smart building, which we are proud to be associated with. Uh, EIB, as I said, we're the world's largest IFI with a balance sheet of 550 billion euro. Uh, it has been a lot of uh, discussions here on the, the bond market and the green bond market, so I would, will spare you from that one, but uh, just to get a, a figure or an, an, uh, an order of magnitude, we issue bonds in, in the area of uh, 60 to 70, 75 billion euro every year. Uh, we were also, uh, many people have been uh, speaking about being the first. Uh, we were the first uh, green bond issuer in the world. Uh, some claim it's the World Bank, but we were actually three months ahead. So we, we are very proud of that one as well. And as uh, Lena mentioned earlier, uh, I dare to say that one of my colleagues, uh, Ayla Kravi, was also one of the drivers be behind the gr green bond principles. So on the, on the borrowing side, I think uh, we are making our fair share. Uh, up to date, we have issued 19.6 uh, billion euro of green bonds, and uh, we will continue to have a, a very high ambition with the green assets between 2016 and 2020 of 100 US dollars, 100 billion US dollars. Uh, on the lending, uh, as uh, Ayla uh, pointed out, and also as Sanda uh, mentioned this morning, uh, following the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, our uh, current uh, president, uh, Werner Hoyer, uh, made a commitment that EIB should at least lend 25% uh, of its total volume every year within Europe to uh, green projects. Uh, outside Europe, we have an even more ambitious target, which is more than 35%. And if you take that, uh, those figures into account, uh, we, we lent last year, 2017, 70 billion euro uh, within uh, Europe or EU. Uh, of which 19.6 billion was for climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So approximately 28% of the total lending within Europe. Uh, outside Europe, we lent uh, 10 billion, and similarly there, we had a, a score of 36 to 37%. On the lending side, we are uh, working a lot uh, with uh, both corporates uh, to finance mainly innovation, uh, but also the public sector to finance uh, transport projects, infrastructure, uh, environmental projects, uh, uh, even their innovative projects, but we also uh, work with uh, partner banks to channel our funding to SMEs. And we have also seen uh, during the last, uh, last two, three years in the public sector that uh, uh, players like uh, Stockholm County Council is getting enormously active on the green bond market, uh, which we then uh, combine our lending funding to uh, similar projects. We, uh, we lend um, uh, in the Nordics around uh, 1.5 billion to Finland and similarly to Sweden, a bit less uh, in Denmark and, and also a bit less in the three Baltic states because of the sizes. But we encourage uh, and we're having the climate change mitigation adaptation target 25%. We encourage and actually from time to time cherry pick uh, projects which are green. And uh, like uh, municipality or Munifin said earlier, we also um, give a, a discount uh, of a number of basis points to uh, make sure that our lenders uh, take uh, this responsibility seriously. Uh, and also, uh, like said earlier, 
uh, there will obviously be a little bit more of work uh, for our uh, borrowers in order to um, to meet the uh, the objectives that we have set under the the lending. Uh, in terms of corporates, uh, we do, uh, for the time being, very much green housing, so near uh, zero energy buildings. Uh, we have done a number of deals with, uh, in Sweden, but also in Finland, with uh, corporates that you may know of. In the public sector, we do uh, smart transport solutions, uh, try to uh, focus on uh, on transport modes which are electrical uh, and uh, not fossil fuel uh, driven. And also with our partner banks, we encourage uh, SME lending, which is uh, green. And uh, there we have said that uh, maybe 25% is not enough, but uh, 30%. So uh, also to reach out to the small and medium-sized enterprises uh, and also to the smaller municipalities like uh, Ayla said, uh, has no access really to, to the bond market. So I know uh, we are getting close to lunch, so I think I will keep it there. And uh, thank you for your, uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, then I will be happy to respond later. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was really, really helpful. I'll, and uh, many of us who have been following the green bond market uh, know of your, your role there and, and uh, how much you and, and Ayla uh, have contributed to this. And, and I must say also that we have NIB in the room who uh, is doing a similar job and, and currently in the XCOM. So uh, we are having a very good, good footprint in, in, in the room today. Uh, and it's important, of course, that you also give uh, the possibility for the smaller entities and give a clear guidance that what do they need to do in order to be eligible, because I, I suppose it could be more difficult for smaller entities to understand that what is relevant. So that is helpful guidance for developing the market as such. Uh, then we have Latvian Baltic Energy Efficiency Fund, uh, Nikolas Tanshov. And, um, I think you are going to talk more about from the energy point of view. Well, we're starting with the smallest. Okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> we are, we, I'm standing up for all of you because you all want to stretch me first. Um, since I can do it, I'm doing it. Um, LABIF is a financial instrument which basically refinances the EPCs it has designed by buying the contractor's serve receivables once the project has been done. And I'm very grateful to be able to share our experience. I thank Sanda. Uh, in 2012, the Banking Association of Latvia held at Citadella the first discussion about this concept. And it's been six years where I've been saying it's the biggest uh, thing happening. The train is leaving. Uh, it's leaving, but quite slowly at the moment still. But I do agree with everyone here that this train is not stoppable, which is why, and here back to one of the things I said this morning, as an American, What's different is we were taught to put our money where our mouth is. However, what I've learned from the Nordic countries is this inconceivable, incredible ability to work together. We don't know how to do that as well in the States, I must say. And I'm very, very impressed. And I think one of the problems, and now I've gone off script, one of the problems that the Nordics have is how do we get other countries to get the Nordic habit? Because it is really impressive. Everything from how do you get a cup of coffee to how do you borrow billions of euros. Um, so our project actually was, was based on the fact that having lived in Eastern Europe some time, I realized there was an incredible opportunity, having also been an investor in real estate. And that is that there's well over 4 billion square meters of substandard, very inefficient buildings in Eastern Europe from Tallinn to Tirana. If we only do one quarter of those buildings, we're looking at 180 billion of investments, the same that apparently the EU has to do a year. So one year investment would bring 21 million tons of CO2 reduction, the equivalent of what Estonia consumes today, or expresses today. But opportunity doesn't imply accessibility. And this is where, where, where institutions like EIB um, SEB, et cetera, is where we need to get to them so as to turn this 
uh, opportunity into something accessible. And what we've done basically is the same questions that are being asked at the highest levels, we asked at a micro level, how do we build uh, SEG inside a, a building, basically, and how do we replicate that? We want to buy savings. Building owners want to buy certainty, certainty that they will pay for an improved asset. And Labif's processes are designed to do that. Labif does this by purchasing the receivables from the contracted designs and only disperses one season after the works have been actually implemented. So we did this because we made a major assumption. We had a major uh, uh, premise and an assertion. Assumption, we will continue to be short-term thinkers. If there's a $1 bulb for one year or a $2.5 bulb for five years, we'll buy the $1 bulb. The premise, we need two triggers for this to work so as to Labis be able to lead it. We need to be able to access huge amounts of cash and once we get to that scale, it will trigger a change in how the building industry works. They will go industrial, the way it's happening, for instance, Energy Spong in Holland, where they've taken the cost of renovating to energy neutral a house from 180 euros per, uh, per square meter down to 60, I believe, at this point. Well, I think it's 180,000 for the total cost, 62,000 for the total cost. Um, this first trigger requires risk mitigation. It requires fair returns. It requires transparency. SGE rules basically wrapped in a product that's easy, quick to deliver to the final customer. They don't want to understand all of this. Our financial instrument is delivered via the cloud and verified via the cloud. That's the first step. We separate execution risk from payment risk. The design and delivery is complex. And in order to do that, the people who do it need to take a lot of risks. Therefore, they should get most of the rewards. And we want them to continue to guarantee their work for the duration of the project. In our case, we say this is real estate. That should be 20 to 40 years. I used to say 15 to 25. But in this room, I think you understand, real estate is for the long term. And therefore, if we want the ESCO to guarantee their work for a long time, they need to profit for a long time. The final beneficiaries, on the other hand, want to enter into a contract which delivers a building fit for purpose. <laughs> guaranteed safety, guaranteed health, guaranteed standards, and of course, affordability. An EPC that can be enforced and which we can help to enforce. By de-risking execution risk and allocating it to the companies, Labif takes on the payment risk to deliver at once steady, long-term, and fair returns for the low risk taken. A perfect vehicle for pension funds, especially in Eastern Europe, where in the case of the residents themselves would be benefiting from the investment and they're paying into those pensions. Therefore, to align the interests of all stakeholders in a transparent manner, an online multi-sided platform is essential. And it provides a benchmark for other initiatives in the building renovation sector. I said 4 billion square meters in Eastern Europe. In all of Europe, there are many more of these products, projects, not as many, not as condensed, and not as standardizable. Um, the barriers is legal frameworks. The barriers are other stakeholders who will, may not find benefit. Think about district heating companies. And I thank you only to say that we have delivered a few firsts. And Latvia's last parliamentary election, one of the parties actually used the word ESCO in their platform, which means that we've actually managed to get the word out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very good presentation on an actual project, ongoing opportunity uh, that is... Uh, yes, I'm uh, sorry. I did forget to say we have dispersed on an EBRD loan six buildings so far. Thank you. Okay. okay. So it's something that is actually creating uh, not only an investment opportunity, but actually a real change in, in the housing sector, which is a big emitter of carbon uh, in, in all economies. Uh, I would like to close off this panel by asking a very quick, maximum one sentence, can also be two words, uh, uh, your personal view, but what makes you optimistic and positive in terms of what will take us to the next level of, of integrating sustainability into the finance? 
your personal view um, and um, something positive. <laughs> Do you want to go in order? Or? Yeah, I, I can start. I think one sentence, um, increased awareness. And perhaps the second one, uh, let's say, seemed to be uh, a lot more money on the table for these kind of projects. Excellent. Next, please. Working together. Good. Nordic way. Nordic way. Excellent. Yeah, yeah I would say the train has already left the station <laughs> and it will only increase in speed. So like that. And we just need to all take our own personal responsibility to nudge it forward. Jump on. Jump on the train. Yeah, we have been focusing so much on the on the green bonds, uh, and but we also have social bonds that are built on a similar concept, uh, determining the use of proceeds, uh, verification, and reporting. Uh, we also have green equity coming, which is, I think, uh, even more delicate thing because uh, you know, in in a bond space, you borrow a certain amount of money and make sure you spend it in the right way and report the impact. With green equity. <laughs> another sales this is coming, <laughs> and this is good news for NASDAQ and for this community. Excellent. So more trains. more trains. Not only one train, many trains on track already. And Eric? Uh, continue to have high ambitions, uh, not least outside EU in the developing countries. Exactly. I think this is, this is very encouraging. Thank you very much for this fantastic panel and uh, all your contribution. Uh, Sanda, can we take questions? I hear we have a couple of minutes for questions uh, from the audience, if there are any. Yeah, everybody's too hungry, so. Um, so, as uh, we committed on all the panels and all the time to uh, complete the event on time, so we will still try to uh, stick to this. Uh, so, first of all, um, uh, let me just, uh, before the thank yous, do the ad admin uh, announcement, which is that after the lunch, uh, which is... I, I hope out there waiting for you. Uh, we will um, uh, be uh, moving on for the study tour at Munifin, um, and tremendous thanks uh, for Munifin to agreeing to host us. So I hope Joachim will uh, will help us uh, get there. Uh, we have a nice 20 minutes uh, walk planned uh, in the in the nice uh, Helsinki uh, weather. That's, that's not not so different from the other capitals we come from. So so that's that uh, to take forward the uh, and deepen the discussion on how. Min Municipalities, other corporates uh, on the public side access the capital markets uh, in uh, Finland and also on similar setups uh, exist across the Scandinavian countries. So from my side and from um, uh, jointly as organizers uh, with Finance Finland and European Commission, first of all, let me thank all the panelists, all the speakers uh, today. This has been a, a fascinating day and I think we really achieved what we set out, which is that it's not a discussion of the financial sector for the financial sector, but really bringing in a range of uh, stakeholders from uh, <coughs> government partners, parliaments, uh, regulators, uh, and, and various uh, other partners in the journey. Um, from our side, uh, tremendous thanks to uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, uh, Maya Telminya from his office, and, and the rest of his team for arranging a, 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 a fantastic high-level <coughs> engagement. Of course, uh, tremendous thanks to European Banking Federation, also represented by Antony uh, here today, uh, the Lithuanian Banking Federation, uh, the Estonian Banking Association, who were the joint uh, partners for, for this event for us uh, here. And um, also, Finance Latvia Association members who were uh, very active in, in making sure that we have an event here, which is uh, the OP, uh, the SEB Bank, and uh, tremendous thanks in particular to Yeva um, Tetere, the uh, chair, uh, the, also the council member of the association, and our Swedbank colleagues uh, uh, from across the Baltics. And this would not be um, uh, all if I didn't say particular thanks to our finance uh, Finland colleagues, uh, of course, Pianura herself. 
uh, ESCO, um, um, Christina, Area, Nura, Johanna, and Satu for making all of this uh, event possible here today. So with that, uh, I think I've run through my list of thank yous. So tremendous thanks to the audience for bearing with us. And the key challenge for all of us will be taking back. And uh, I am definitely will be getting into the discussions at the uh, Finance Latvia Association with the co-chair of the Lending Committee, Santa Purgaile, with Eva uh, Tetere and others around to, uh, to make sure that we figure out the best way to take these discussions forward uh, locally as well. So tremendous thanks and onwards and upwards.